Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Morning. Can you, Anna Maria, would you be able to scroll down with the agenda just for everyone to have a good look of where we're? Um, uh, yes, happening? Luisa. Or Luisa, can you do that, please? Sure. So, would you like me to keep scrolling? Yeah, just scroll down a little bit. Even more? Or should I go up again? And then this afternoon, we've got the breakout sessions. Exactly. Perfect. Okay. All right. If you go back up again, that's fine. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Hi, Luisa. Hi. Who's the caption? The caption oh, yeah. to be assigned the API code. All right. So should I sign it now? Yes, please. Uh, I think I'm not the host right now um, because there's um, live streaming or webs uh, websites. So I'm not sure right now. Yeah, I think Drini, are you there? To assign the captioner. Because I don't see it now in yes, my. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Oh, thank All you. right. Thank you. All right. Maybe we can give it a couple of more minutes as I see more people are joining us before we start. Ladies and gentlemen, it's um, 10.04 by me. We are almost 10.05. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon for some of you. Uh, welcome to the ITU Regional Forum uh, for Europe uh, on digital skills development. Um, my special uh, welcome uh, goes also to a series of the panelists um, whom we will have the pleasure to hear uh, from shortly. My name is Jaroslav Ponder, and as a head of the ITU office, it's my great pleasure uh, to open this, uh, this event on behalf of the ITU and also moderate some of the sessions uh, together uh, with um, Anna, uh, who is also the part of the team of the Europe office. 
Uh, before we are starting our uh, session and the event, I would like to hand over the floor to our technical uh, moderator who will share with us uh, some housekeeping information. The floor is yours. <laughs> Sorry about that. So I will read the guidelines. So dear participants, thank you for joining. My name is Luisa Badulescu and I will be the remote participation uh, moderator for the event. Before starting the meeting, I would like to give you some instruction on the Zoom platform and the meeting. So the meeting is entirely remote. The audience is kindly asked to keep their microphone switched off. The moderator of the session will address the speakers and will give you the floor when your turn comes. You may use the chat for any questions or comments. So please include your name and affiliation for making it easier for the organizers. Moderators will be monitoring and any comment may be read out if time allows. When the floor is open to the audience, please raise your hand to request the floor. The raise hand function is located at the bottom of the participant window. To access the participant window, click the participant button in the bottom bar of the Zoom interface. You can view and activate the captioning by clicking on the closed caption in the bottom bar of the Zoom interface. We kindly ask you to display your full name and affiliation if possible. Incomplete or suspicious information may cause you to be removed from the meeting room. The meeting is being, is being recorded and the recording will be used for report, writing and communication purpose. Thank you. Great, thank you very much for this information. And I would like to inform you that also this event is live streamed uh, on the YouTube channel and the Twitter account of the at ITU Europe. And so we encourage you also to share uh, the news uh, during the event about this through your social media, but also after the event when uh, this um, event will be remaining there for the reference. Today's event's uh, format is very special, uh, and this workshop in particular is um, and taking a look at the possibility of engaging uh, the all stakeholders um, in the work on the as on the digital skills. This is the reason why we have also proposed to, during this event to hold the implementation laboratory, which is the example uh, of uh, the way how we can uh, closer interact between each other and so to identify a certain uh, challenges uh, which are relevant to our regional actions, but more importantly to the national implementation. After the lunch, as you will see, we will break out uh, to the different uh, groups where we are looking forward uh, to have the uh, clear discussions on the digital skills development uh, with uh, the representatives of the uh, government, private sector and academia and the other groups, uh, and also to take a look how uh, the products of the ITU, in particular guidebook on the uh, development of the, on the digital skills assessment uh, can be of the use uh, for uh, this different uh, type of the stakeholders. So please uh, be prepared for the exciting discussions uh, during the course of uh, today. But before we are starting, we'll have also a series of uh, the different interventions coming from the regional stakeholders active in the field of the digital skills, but also uh, from the stakeholders uh, who are um, uh, very much taking a look at this exercise as the opportunity to embark on the journey uh, on strengthening digital uh, skills uh, development at the country level, at the regional level, or contributing to the global efforts. There is no, uh, it's difficult to deny that uh, the digital became our new reality, in particular the, during the COVID time. And for the ITU, digital is not uh, something new, but its, uh, its dimension um, has been so much strengthened during the COVID time that we are uh, 
taking a look at, uh, the, in particular last year, as the great opportunity to accelerate digital transformation uh, and um, in particular the work on the digital skills, which is the fundamental need uh, to be addressed during the uh, COVID times and any time of the unexpected uh, happening like pandemics. This is the reason why let me uh, welcome today so many great speakers and those who are uh, really uh, doing great progress at the country level. Also, let me thank uh, our colleagues from the ITU, Susan Telcher, uh, who are leading the digital skills uh, work at our level, at the global level, uh, with uh, the clear objective. Uh, to strengthen the preparedness of the countries and to transform the connectivity uh, into the meaningful connectivity that all population can clearly see how and to use the all benefits of the digital sp space in the daily life. Before we are embar we'll embark on the first session, I have a great pleasure also to share with you and uh, some highlights of uh, the work which we have carried out uh, under the regional initiative uh, on the digital inclusion, uh, which encompasses the work on the digital skills. Uh, we took a look at the possibility of uh, seeing uh, what is the dynamics of the diff in different countries, in particular focusing on the non-EU countries, non-EU non countries. Next slide, please. Within this context, uh, we tried to take a look uh, following uh, the and uh, the guidebook, um, uh, the guidebook recommendations on the assessment of the digital skills development. Uh, what is happening in the Albania, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Georgia, Moldova, Montenegro, North Macedonia, Serbia, Turkey, and Ukraine in order to be prepared to serve better and to address the real needs of those who need uh, the support at uh, this moment. We took a look at uh, the macroeconomic conditions, uh, skills development policies in the region, education demands and type of digital skills needed, digital skills gap and the ICT infrastructure. The executive summary of uh, this investigation has been made in the, uh, on the website. Uh, however, our journey is not stopped there. As I mentioned, the purpose of this exercise was more and uh, to build a community and to build uh, the proper as network of those who are working on digital skills and who are committed uh, to advance digital skills uh, further. Next slide. In general, these nine countries are demonstrating a huge potential for the growth. And there is uh, in 2019, before the pandemics broke, um, we observed a significant uh, growth in the GDP. Uh, however, those countries still belong uh, to the low income uh, countries. Uh, which were the digital skills can, uh, can offer and uh, a great opportunity uh, for scaling uh, up. Uh, even though there are some strengths like in the, in the competitiveness um, index comparison, uh, we see some strengths of the, uh, the countries in, um, in respect to the health, uh, primary education, macroeconomic environment, higher education training and good market efficiency. Uh, we see that still uh, has to be done in terms of the technical, technological uh, readiness or the inno innovation, uh, which is still um, grow, evolving. We have to also take a look at the closer look uh, at uh, the different dynamics in terms of the opportunities uh, for the young people and in particular focusing on the uh, youth unemployment. Next slide. Uh, we took a look and glance uh, what is happening with the digital skills policies and we notice uh, that even though a lot is happening in terms of the developing the national um, uh, national uh, strategies, but they are uh, general. Digital skills are embedded in the larger uh, or specific uh, items uh, related uh, to the ICT development, uh, should it be uh, the um, uh, the digital agendas focusing on the investment on the uh, ICT infrastructure uh, or uh, the public sector or ICT for education uh, or e government uh, or the others. Uh, there are only few which are 
uh, taking the digital skills uh, very much on the high of the priorities. And this situation, which we observed in 2020, is changing and evolving significantly as uh, the countries have noticed a significant interest in uh, making digital skills as the one of the prerequisites of uh, the environment uh, and the preparedness for any kind of uh, the pandemics. This is the reason why uh, we stand ready to, to work with the countries, uh, those in particular who are uh, willing to advance fast uh, to assist them in uh, making the assessment and development of the digital skills. Strategies, next slide. We've noticed also and took a look at uh, the educational systems and uh, we've noticed uh, that uh, in many countries uh, the uh, digital education is one of the priorities. In, in Albania, for example, ICT for education is part of the national digital agenda targeting 100% internet access for education, equipping schools and uh, embedding ICTs into the teacher trainings. In Moldova, digital um, Moldova includes programs for digital education in compulsory and general and continuing education and the institution program digital skills for all. So as we see, uh, a lot is happening at the level of the strategic uh, action, but also a lot is happening uh, in uh, the uh, at the level of the implementation. Next slide. But there is a huge demand uh, for uh, different types of the skills at the country level, depending on the, um, of the type of the country uh, and uh, also uh, of the um, availability of ICTs. Uh, the companies, uh, we, they're screaming uh, for the people and the young professionals who are properly educated and properly deployable uh, corresponding to their uh, needs. There is a lot of work to be done in terms of the reskilling and upskilling, as well as in development of the uh, talent acquisition. Next slide. This is the reason why uh, we notice a lot of things which need to be closed in terms of the digital uh, gaps and which should and be targeted through the uh, harmonized approach for the region. We, are, we have also with our investigation uh, took a look, next slide, at the ICT infrastructure, taking a look if uh, the ICT infrastructure plays an important role, and it does. Even though all countries are on the good path towards uh, being the leader in the digital, uh, we are still remaining the mobile uh, society, uh, which creates a lot of opportunities, but in particular in the times of the pandemics, we notice that not only the access is a challenge, but also uh, the um, uh, ownership of the devices becomes a big burden uh, for making the progress in the terms of the uh, closing the gaps on the digital skills. This is the reason uh, why the concentrated assistance uh, to some countries and the special programs uh, developing and uh, ensuring the self-sustainability would be of the use uh, and great help uh, to those uh, countries. So with this uh, uh, highlight, uh, we wanted only to draw your attention to the ongoing work at the IT level uh, and the discussions we are holding uh, with several countries on the concrete actions uh, with the engagement of the UN system. But now let me um, uh, let me invite you uh, to the first session of this meeting, uh, where I have great pleasure uh, and privilege to welcome on board um, the several speakers. It includes the Susan Telcher, Head of the Capacity and Skills Development Division for ITU, Agi Veres, Deputy Regional Director for Europe and Central uh, and CIS region of the UNDP, uh, Nina Ferencic, um, Senior Regional Advisor of Adolescent Health, Development and Participation of UNICEF, Isabella Milewska, Chair of the Digital Skills Working Group of the Digital Europe, uh, Pranvera uh, Castrati, uh, Senior Expert of Economic and Digital Connectivity of the RCC, and Michal uh, Zoga, um, MA Director of the Global uh, Partnerships and, um, and Initiatives of the Intel. 
as you have already noticed, uh, this provides us a great um, uh, set of the speakers who will provide uh, the global perspectives, but also this what we are uh, will be doing at the regional level with the impact generated at the national level. And not to prolong, I have a great pleasure to hand over the floor to Susan Telcher, uh, who will provide us the overview of the uh, our work and uh, which is uh, happening at the global level. Susan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Yaroslav, and good morning, everyone. It's my great pleasure to be part of this important um, event and to start off the first session, which will focus on digital skills development in Europe. So what I would like to do um, at the beginning of this session, I would like to put the topic a bit in the broader context of development, in particular in light of the past year and the pandemic, and then also share with you um, how we in ITU um, try to address the challenge through our different um, activities. Um, next slide, please. So let's look at um, COVID-19 first. So if there is one aspect that clearly came out during the pandemic, it's the importance of good internet connectivity and the fact that many people don't have it and were put at a disadvantage. So first, um, according to UNESCO, about 90% of schools were closed at some point during the pandemic with about 1.6 billion students out of school. And those that had remote learning capabilities that had a huge advantage over those who didn't have that. Also ITU and UNICEF estimate that about two thirds of school children worldwide do not have internet access at home. Um, second, according to ILO, around 93% of the global workforce were affected by workplace closures. So again, those who had the privilege to do jobs that can be done remotely, or those who had the connectivity and capacity to do that were greatly favored. Um, in Europe, around it's estimated that around 40% of the workforce teleworked at some point during the pandemic. So in the future, we expect that some of the new ways of working and learning um, that are enabled by the use of technologies will continue, but that requires reliable and affordable connectivity and a digitally skilled population. But according to ITU, um, there's still 46% of the world population that is offline, even where broadband connectivity is available. Okay, so next slide, please. So COVID uh, clearly brought about the existing and even growing digital skills gap. In ITU, but also others have found that the lack of digital skills is one of the main barriers to internet usage. And that in developing countries, around 65% of people lack the skills to use the internet. But according, at the same time, according to ILO, during the pandemic, employment in ICT related industries experienced the highest growth, but there is a huge skills gap um, globally, um, but also in Europe. For example, if we look at Europe, and I think these numbers are more about the EU, uh, Yaroslav already provided some other info on the Southeast uh, Europe uh, countries. But in the EU, it is estimated that around 40% of the population lacks basic digital skills, that around 90% uh, of uh, future jobs will require digital skills, that there is a huge shortage of IT specialists in the labor market, and only one in six I ICT specialists are female. So it is uh, a global problem. It is a problem also in Europe. And uh, it is addressed among um, other approaches through the European digital, uh, the European skills agenda and the digital education plan. Next slide, please. If we um, look at the digital skills and the digital skills gap, at the global level, there is a gap at all levels of digital skills. And you can see here how we have uh, in our digital skills toolkit, we have dis distinguished um, 
the different skills levels into basic, advanced, intermediate, and advanced. So at the basic level, these are really needed to bring people online, but there's also huge gaps of digitally skilled workers in almost all countries across the world. And these require more intermediate and advanced skills, job ready skills, skills for ICT professions. And with so many people affected by unemployment following the, the crisis or the pandemic, the need for digital skills training will become even more important because this is where many jobs might be found in the future. Next slide, please. So let's look a bit at ITU and some of the solutions that we offer um, in our work. Um, we, uh, our main objective is to develop capacities and skills for the digital economy. Of course, we work uh, globally. We have a big focus on developing countries and we are looking at three approaches uh, to this challenge. One is through training, developing and delivering training courses, um, delivering capacity development workshops. This is, uh, for example, through our IT Academy platform, our Centers of Excellence network. Another stream is then to focus on, on research, develop and disseminate research policy guidelines on digital capacity and on skills de development. And we are very active in engaging in strategic partnerships to do that because we realize that the scaling will come through these strategic partnerships. Next slide, please. Here is a, a little snapshot of our main products and services related to digital skills. I mentioned already the ITU Academy platform. I invite you all to, if you don't know it yet, to, to take a look and see what kind of courses are offered there. This is mostly for the um, uh, ICT professionals, and we work a lot through the Centers of Excellence program to deliver the trainings over the ITU Academy platform. But also I wanted to mention our Digital Transformation Center initiative that was launched last year. And here we work with uh, countries and um, local uh, centers in countries who, de who deliver um, at the community level, more basic and intermediate level, digital skills training. And we try to scale that by uh, creating a network of digital transformation centers globally. And then we have different knowledge resources um, and products on digital skills, such as the digital skills assessment guidebook that will be presented this afternoon, and which is also a basis for the work um, carried out here. Uh, next uh, slide. So before closing, let me highlight one of our recent partnerships that we are developing with UNDP. And I'm also very happy to see that uh, Aki Veris from UNDP is also on this panel here. So here, uh, this partnership focuses on the implementation of one of the key eight areas that came out of the UN Secretary General's roadmap for digital uh, cooperation. This focus um, area is on digital capacity building. And we are working very closely with UNDP and other stakeholders on a number of concrete deliverables and outputs, which we hope to launch this year. They are highlighted here on the slide. Um, we are currently doing a global mapping of all digital capacity initiatives that are being offered by different providers. Um, we are also working towards launching a multi-stakeholder network on digital capacity building. It will be launched later uh, this year. Linked to that, we are working with UNDP to develop a joint facility on capacity development. And uh, that includes an important function, a clearinghouse function to match the demand and the supply for digital capacity building, including many digital skills uh, initiatives. And finally, um, and this is uh, particular through the UNT UNDP uh, network in the countries, the focus of this work is also on strengthening capacity development at the country level. So with this, I would like to close my short introduction and hand back to Jaroslav. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Susan. And in fact, uh, you paved the way towards the next speaker already, uh, talking about our partnership with the UNDP. And it's my great pleasure to welcome Deputy Director of the Regional uh, Office of UNDP for Europe and Central Asia, Agi Veres. Uh, so Agi, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much, Yaroslav, and thank you very much, Susan, for the presentation. Uh, this was extremely informative. So um, despite the fact that we have the partnership, I still have learned a lot from your presentation. And I think it's extremely important to have these basic uh, capacity mappings and, and the data out there so that when we are responding to the needs and demands of the region, we can really rely on, on, on this kind of um, assessment. Um, I wanted to, to talk a little bit about the, um, the they actually very much tied to your, to your presentation on the digital skill development, skill development, but also in terms of what works, what we see as the challenges in the region and, and perhaps what we can do. So if you can please go to the next slide. So essentially, I mean, one of the things that we are seeing is if you look at the sustainable development goals, digital is, is everywhere. So essentially, we're talking about a, a theme that's almost like a, um, a, a precondition for, for achieving a lot of the SDGs. And uh, there's a quote from the UNDP Human Development Report, but it's really about empowering, empowering people to take part and empowering uh, the economies, the uh, governance and, and so forth. If you can go to the next slide, please. So uh, what we have, um, what we have uh, experienced during the COVID-19 response. I mean, this was obviously, we all know it was an unprecedented year and an unprecedented challenge, but at the same time, we have also seen unprecedented opportunities emerging from this. I mean, Susan, you have um, covered some of the, 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 the data and some of the findings about uh, schooling and online working. Um, but essentially, I think what we also need to mention is that Somehow COVID, when it comes to digital, it leapfrogged, at least this region, but I think globally, it leapfrogged something that we were planning to support and see in five years, it happened in one year, out of necessity. So that means that, you know, if you need to invest in, in, in digital skills and in infrastructure, um, you know, there, there is a longer time period for that, but out of necessity, it is possible to speed up. So if it's possible to do it out of necessity, how can we build on that and essentially scale and, and, and expand the scope of it? Um, what we have also seen that there's a really big digital divide that has been exposed. When I talk about leapfrogging the digital response, there are, there are really various degrees of it. Some countries have essentially achieved in one year what they were planning to do maybe in a decade and other countries were struggling to keep up uh, the basics. So what this means is that the digital transformation is very necessary and very helpful, but can also make inequality worse, if not intentionally inclusive. And you um, alluded it in your presentation as well from ITU's perspective on the effect on children, um, developing countries, uh, the most vulnerable and, and especially women that sticks out as well. Um, then we also have the risk of digitalization and we have paid a lot of attention on, on, on the side effects of this, which is about misinformation um, and really kind of uh, spreading, as we all know, the false news and um, potentially in certain areas also contributing to um, extreme uh, violent extremism and uh, in, in, in adverse effects of uh, um, conflict. Um, and lastly, what was clear is that governments which already invested in digital, they responded more effectively. So the early implementers have been able to, to really uh, gear up their governance responses, both in education, health sector, and the uh, teleworking uh, online economy. We can go to the next one, please. Next slide, please. So um, in terms of the digital skills and the access, from our work, what we have seen that the majority of the countries have really enacted the working and studying remotely, requiring a fast adaptation of these digital tools. And um, there, there are a large number of employers who set rapidly digitalized the working processes and they were able to uh, have the workforce operate remotely. At the same time, existing inequalities have been exacerbated due to the pandemic, automation, um, different opportunities, uh, women participation, these are all areas that have suffered. If you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, one of the things that we are particularly worried about is women and digital skills. And this has been coming back in most of the studies and most of the assessments um, that have been done by various organizations. 
Um, I'm just quoting here the IMF here that 180 million predominantly female jobs have a 70% or higher probability of automation, which requires you know, these new skills in work and working arrangements, especially targeting women. But when we compare it with the skills, digital skills level of women, this is the opposite picture. So while it seems that women would need uh, these skills the most, they are the least capacitated, at least in our region, um, on digital skills. This is why we have paid a lot of attention and working now a number of initiatives on women and STEM, uh, try to see how we can integrate um, in, in, in various parts of, of uh, capacitating women through the education system, vocational training and other measures as well. If you can go to the next one, please. So there are um, a lot of, lot of examples and a lot of needs out there. And in the short term, what we've been trying to do is really to support the skills development that better match the market. Um, one thing that I would like to emphasize that came through both from Yaroslav and, and, and Susan before me is that the private sector is, 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 is suffering in terms of the, the capacity that's available for them. On the one hand, they require the technical capacities, but on the other hand, having the digital skills to go with them is absolutely essential. So in that sense, there's a big gap to fill so that we can match the technical capacities of, of people for private sector jobs, but also in teaching and uh, in academia and governance, but it has to be matched with the digital skills. Otherwise they cannot be effective and their employability is really much lower um, in, in the private sector, especially. So just two examples here in Armenia and Serbia, where we have been working on retraining pro programs and web platforms to facilitate uh, job opportunities, especially focusing on women. Next. Um, we're also uh, looking at uh, some other examples. For example, in Kazakhstan, um, it's, uh, our efforts were about providing business continuity for, for the government during the pandemic by supporting the telecommuting arrangements. Um, the focus on increasing digital literacy of users of public services so that the e-governance efforts are also going hand in hand with digital liter literacy of citizens so they can actually effectively take advantage of, of, of the online services. Um, in Turkey, it's a very good example where uh, when we are saying it's the most vulnerable that suffer from the digital skill gaps, when we look at, um, for example, refugees, um, they need to be integrated into the society and Turkey is, is, is uh, hosting a large number of refugees with the intent to integrate them into the education system and, 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 and the municipalities where they live. So this requires additional attention to, to these particular vulnerable groups. Next. Now, if you look at the medium term, so I think on the short term, it's really about catching up on skill sets, capacity building, putting things online. Um, in addition to the whole infrastructure gap. But if you're looking at the medium term, what we need to look at is really the ecosystem support. So it's through a diversity of platform that we're supporting a drive, uh, a diverse actors to enhance digital capabilities and challenge the existing norms and value systems. Um, so if you look at the, 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 the pictogram, it's really about the communities, the institutions, the individuals, the governments and the environment that we need to, to pull together so that we create a platform that uses the knowledge and advocacy to advance um, uh, the, the uh, inclusiveness, uh, including on the, the digital skill building. So these are really uh, need to go through a coordinated and diverse uh, set of networks that can help build more inclusive, innovative and productive businesses in key STEM uh, sectors. Next. Um, just uh, an example of a facility uh, in terms of what, how, how we are um, approaching this issue um, that we are working with other partners as well to bring together the financing, the skill set, the education, the governance and the private sector. So we have an example on a digital growth facility that we are, we are just starting to experiment with. Next. Um, I don't want to spend a lot on, on, on this slide. I think the key principles have come through very clearly before. It's really about inclusion, equity, innovation, and the partnerships. Next. So um, in terms of concluding it, I think um, 
you posed the question before is what are the, the, the key uh, policy measures or key principles that are most important in terms of this digital skills, um, filling the digital skills gap. I think from what we have seen in this region and through the interventions that are happening in the countries, I really would say that if we have one area to address, it's about women and digital skills, because that connects so many issues in terms of the job market, uh, gender equality, uh, women's participation in um, both in terms of uh, the economic uh, and uh, uh, political sphere and overall empowering women. So I think if we can affect 50% of the population um, and build their digital skills, we have a, a big step forward. Of course, this uh, requires all the policy areas and the governments um, uh, putting the right measures in place. But if I have to pinpoint on one issue, I would say it's women and STEM. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, excellent presentation and overview of the approach uh, and also the, the prioritization. This is very important uh, in particular in the work on, the, uh, on, um, on this subject. Uh, but talking about the prioritization, let us uh, now turn to our colleagues from the UNICEF. Um, to Nina uh, Ferenci, uh, who uh, is representing uh, the, the UNICEF and uh, we are looking forward to hear maybe more of the focus on the youth, uh, I, I would assume, but let's, let's hear. Thank you very much, Yaroslav. Uh, uh, thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, my name is Nina Ferencic and I'm from the UNICEF Regional Office for Europe and Central Asia. Um, uh, I think that, for, as Yaroslav said, for us, the key focus is children and adolescents and young people. So I will try to perhaps, uh, next slide, to, to perhaps paint the picture in a way. Uh, everybody knows that young people today are the so-called the connected generation. Connectivity is so important. Even before COVID, we all knew that, even as parents, how important the worst punishment for a kid today is to remove, to take their phone away, right? So I think uh, one, of the, one of the best abbreviations I've heard is this, that this is the generation apatad, which is, any place, any time, any device. So clearly there is a lot of focus of young people on technology, on being connected. And we see the, the overall, even though the whole world's population is connected, but when it comes to young people, they're always even more connected than the, than the rest of the population. So it's a generational issue for many of the young people of today. Uh, next. So, however, what's important to know is that uh, at the same time, that doesn't necessarily mean that young people automatically have the digital skills just because they're young. We conducted a number of, of, of uh, assessments and actually um, polls, opinion polls with young people about various aspects of, of learning, of living with, during COVID. And you could see that some, that some of the challenges as the world went viral and uh, online, uh, some of the challenges they saw, they found is the lack of, of teacher training capacity. I mean, a lot of things there that they are talking about, which actually enter into the sphere of digital skills. So it is not an automatic transition, even for young people to have the skills to follow. So uh, to follow education, to follow online learning, to follow online, uh, move to online jobs, etc. It requires an investment. So uh, next slide, please. One of the things that we would like that we're doing as UNICEF, we're certainly trying to to uh, work a lot more on equipping learners, students um, with the necessary digital competence and digital skills. Uh, these are some examples. We are uh, equipping, working with teachers because this is a key issue that we saw. In many countries, there were stories which are quite moving in a way that the power relations within the classroom all of a sudden changed as kids were teaching 
uh, where, where as young people and children pretty much were telling their teachers how to organize the WhatsApp groups or how to deliver content online and so on. It was some very, very heartwarming stories there. And of course, equipping parents. That's another thing where we see huge gaps because of course, we also know that children who have the parental support with things like homework and things like supporting their learning, they do better. This is part of the equity gap that some of the some of the previous speakers have been talking about. So these are some of the issues that we've been working on, learners, teachers, parents, through a number of initiatives across the region. Uh, next, uh, what, but what I also want to talk about is the fact that a lot of the skills building actually happens out of school settings, in out of school settings. And we have one program, for example, which is the so-called Upshift program. And, and it is a program that actually teaches young people to, to become socially aware entrepreneurs, if you want, uh, to try and problem solve in their communities. This is a program that has been uh, introduced in about 16 countries of our region. It's a program that started in our region that is now global with more than 36 countries introducing this upshift model, which is basically a whole set of modules where through mentoring, et cetera, and through boot camps, you teach young people to problem solve, to critical thinking skills and, uh, and um, teamwork, network, uh, to, to solve problems in their communities. But what's interesting is that with COVID, that upshift program, which teaches these skills, had to go digital as well. And one of the quick, one of the big lessons we've learned is the fact that you can you can actually transfer a program like that onto the digital setting, onto the online setting, without necessarily losing quality. It's different, of course, but have, but has the capacity to reach a lot more people than a lot more young students be, than than it was the case before when these activities were in person. So in a sense, it's an interesting uh, compromise. We lose perhaps some of, the, some of the enthusiasm of being mentored by someone who's next to you, but we gain a lot in terms of skills and reaching a lot more young people with these programs. So there are important opportunities to build skills and, and the, the, past, the moving of this upshift program to the digital environment required a lot of uh, adaptation and a lot of quick skills building for the adolescents and young people themselves. So next slide, please. So just as a summary, perhaps, uh, what we have been seeing is uh, developing in developing digital competence in Europe and Central Asia is, as colleagues have said before, the digital divide, the, the imbalanced focus on equipment and infrastructure rather than on digital competencies that Yaroslav talked about, issues of social norms, gender stereotypes. Uh, also, even when children and young people possess digital skills, as I mentioned, they are not digitally competent necessarily. There is a lot more investment and fine tuning that is needed, including in terms of going to these more advanced intermediate or advanced digital skills. A lot of them have just the basics. Um, schools so far have been doing a rather negligible contribution to skills building, uh, and this there is require there it requires a lot more uh, investment in that, a lot more combined strategies, combining uh, curricular reforms and digital skills in there. Uh, parents and teachers, as I mentioned, a key a key support system for young people, and if they are behind. Their, young, their, their students and their children won't be able to progress either. And sometimes teaching parents from early on uh, is, is, is a way also to make sure that they take care of things like safety of their kids online and so on. Uh, we need to scale up the out of school initiatives through innovation labs, through hackathons, but also through volunteering and working in, in, in places that where there is a need for digital skills as a way of creating that capacity among young people. What we see as priorities, of course, as everybody has said before, universal digital connectivity, leave no one offline. Uh, also preparing young people as leaders in digital transition because it is, it is something where they can and they want to take the lead. 
um, uh, integrating development of, 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 these, of, the, of, of young people, parents and teachers, digital competence within the education system digitalization. This is the place that still today reaches the vast majority of children, adolescents, parents. So the educational system is an important place to invest. Uh, at the same time, uh, we still need to make sure and we'll do a lot more on safeguarding children's rights in the digital learning space and in the online space. And another thing that we really need to address heads on, oftentimes, whether we like it or not, there is uh, some elements in, in pol in politi among political authorities that still perceive um, internet access as something that, especially for children and adolescents, as something that should be controlled, that should be limited. So in the name of safeguarding children, sometimes access to internet is severely cut and severely reduced. So addressing those mindsets that where in the name of protection, there is lack of access to even essential information for young people is something that needs that that needs to be addressed as well in as we work on these policies and, and environmental systems so next slide please so uh, i think that as we move forward um what we will be doing uh, together with colleagues on in this call is supporting the digital transition um making sure we work on the youth engagement, especially girls and marginalized young people. I think that the ITU's Generation Connect is an excellent, excellent example of how engaging with young people is a two-way street. On the one hand, we equip Adoles children, adolescents, and young people with the digital skills they need. But on the other hand, they can also be key partners in making sure that those skills are, 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 are moved and, and connected to others. So the Generation Connect of ITU has already given an excellent uh, set of guidance of what they think is important because they are in the IT field and they know the expertise, the solutions, and the, the online, um, the, the, they, and the young people can, can teach us about how to deal with fake news, how we've seen in the COVID epidemic, how to deal with online violence, et cetera. So they are the ones who can come up with the solutions and they are the ones who, if we, we engage them better, we can get a lot more done. But they're also, um, they can also help upskills upskill those from more rural and disadvantaged communities. We have some excellent examples of that, where there is programs, for example, in Turkey, where the, the Turkish kids are teaching those from, from disadvantaged backgrounds on how to access the internet and building their skills. So they can be important partners as we move in this process of, uh, of, of building skills. We also need a better understanding of the uh, and data on the skills mismatch mismatch between what's needed for jobs and what we equip young people with. Uh, sound policies and programs on digitalization. Uh, there is the whole issue of certifying digital skills development. This is a challenge because a lot of young people spend their time, build their skills, and they don't have the recognition that they need to then demonstrate this as they seek employment. And of course, the issue of effective partnerships for co-creation, human-centered design, et cetera, and using some of these as we develop both policies and as we implement programs. Two other things that I'd like to mention quickly is that we are also, as UNICEF, working on initiatives on e-health, especially e-mental health for young people. This is something that in COVID, we saw that this is a, a, one of the top priorities for young people together with jobs is to deal with their mental health. We're working on making sure services are available a lot more broadly online to use, um, uh, including online counseling, using peers, et cetera. So we're developing some approaches for that and we look forward to working with you on that. But also we're continuing to work on the issue of cybersecurity, protection of kids online, protection against sexual exploitation, protection of all those things, where we're seeing that the lack of digital skills, even in places like police forces, like um, national prosecutors, judges, etc., is one of the key obstacles for addressing this uh, sexual violence against children and ensuring kids are protected and safeguarded when online. So next slide, thank you very much for your attention. Happy to discuss further as, as we move on. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Nina, for uh, this uh, comprehensive uh, overview of this, what UNICEF uh, is doing and where are the top priorities uh, to go with the uh, advancing the digital skills uh, in, in our region. Um, and now let me uh, turn uh, to uh, Isabella Milewska, uh, who is um, uh, representing Digital Europe. Uh, so let me turn uh, to those who are also um, leading in fact, the huge program uh, of the European Union on uh, in this area. Uh, we are very much interested in learning more details on this and the implications for the EU countries, but also non-EU countries. So, Isabella, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jaroslav. I hope you'll see me uh, and hear me well uh, as I'm uh, in a remote location these days. Um, and thank you for the invitation. It's really a pleasure and a real honor to, to be within this group of such distinguished uh, speakers. I really listened uh, to the previous presentations with much attention and I have to admit I've learned a lot. So thank you for, for sharing those interesting insights. Uh, just a couple of words just to introduce uh, Digital Europe. Um, we are actually uh, an association of more than 35,000 um, organizations and companies around Europe that are interested in the digital sector. So we work and focus mostly on the developments within the uh, European Union, but our members also recruit from uh, outside of the EU um, with, uh, with uh, members from uh, from Belarus or from uh, UK for this matter, for that matter. So I have the pleasure to lead the efforts uh, around the digital skills within the working group uh, that recruit its members from companies and national uh, IT uh, associations that are really interested in this topic. So uh, with that, uh, with this couple of minutes, I wanted to give you an overview of how industry in Europe, in the, within the European Union, perceives uh, the, the priorities in the context of digital skills and how we reflect uh, to, uh, in, in the context of the European Union uh, strategies and programs that are being implemented. If I can ask for the next slide. Uh, so, um, in order to kind of like start thinking about where the emphasis should be put on, uh, I like to use the, the digital skills pyramid uh, that has been developed um, by one of the experts uh, in the European uh, Commission. That pyramid obviously starts with digital uh, literacy, goes through digital user skills, practitioner skills, and finally concluding with digital or e-leaders. Uh, what I like to think or reflect on is that there's a difference between uh, those who are digital users and those that are cre uh, digital creators or digital innovators, those that we want to have within the society as many as possible. And to do that, uh, we should, of course, start and build from digital literacy, but never stop at that level. And in that context, if, you, if we uh, think about our youngest generations that are digital native or always connected, as Nina has um, elaborated uh, uh, just a few minutes ago, uh, what I uh, we're, uh, we're looking at from industry perspective is that that digital native generation is uh, absolutely digitally literate and they are perfect uh, digital users. But the problem starts when we want to uh, want to sort of convert those user skills into the practitioner skills and aim for digital innovation and digital creativity. Um, and uh, with that, uh, whatever happens with the latest technology, with all the latest uh, technology trends such as cloud computing, machine learning, big data, cybersecurity, all that happens uh, uh, well above digital literacy or even starts just somewhere 
we're in the middle of digital user skills level. Uh, and so if we think about building strategies or implementing programs that would really be comprehensive, we need to look at every step of the way in this uh, sort of digital skills pyramid and we should strive to, uh, uh, to, to create, to produce as much talent as possible that will be really ready to, to create and to innovate in this uh, digital um, uh, industry. Next slide, please. Can you actually hear me? Ah. Uh, slide before, yeah, this one, thank you. That one, thanks. So a couple of considerations when we think about uh, building strategies around digital skills from a perspective of uh, industry actors. First of all, uh, we certainly need to focus on securing the right level of digital skills within the future workforce. So those that are uh, uh, students in the primary, secondary, and also higher education. Uh, that said, though, we cannot forget and we cannot um, uh, stop thinking about what happens with the current workforce, what kind of reskilling and upskilling uh, people that are already uh, that graduated from uh, any formal education institution need to convey in order to be ready for digital jobs of tomorrow. When it comes to future workforce, absolutely connectivity and, and broadband is key and the availability of the right devices for learning, uh, as well as uh, developing new hybrid learning models that are ready for in-person delivery as well as remote learning. Uh, but that should not be disconnected uh, from making sure that the teachers are ready for that technology revolution. Uh, it was already mentioned that actually teachers readiness is absolutely key. And you know that the youngest generation are actually struggling to follow uh, online classes, not just because of uh, some uh, issues with the technology, but also because the fact that teachers not, are not always ready to deliver on a quality class. Uh, the, remotely. And then digital literacy really defined not just uh, as very basics, uh, such as using the computer, using the internet, but including programming and coding, uh, computational thinking. And it is uh, in line with, with the fact that we really want to develop uh, and produce as many uh, digital creators and digital innovators as possible. Nowadays, really digital skills should be defined not just as a sort of pure technical uh, knowledge, technical skill set, but really as a combination of both technical, analytical and problem solving skills, including that focus on lifelong learning and readiness to learn throughout the entire uh, professional career and professional life. You cannot stop when you graduate from a school or university, you have to continue. And that leads me to, uh, to, the, to the considerations around the uh, current for, uh, workforce. So I mentioned reskilling and upskilling up is absolutely critical. Uh, we need to be mindful of what are we reskilling or upskilling for? So what are the jobs available in the local market, on the global market as well? Today, when you, uh, when you can uh, deliver on your work remotely, your employer can be on the other end of the world as long as you know what and how to deliver. And so uh, this sort of thinking globally but acting locally is absolutely critical building strategies that include 
the industry actors that include local employers that will help define what's needed is absolutely critical and combined with that focus on advanced digital skills, uh, as well as making sure that whatever the training program you build, there is a path to employment for that individual after uh, finishing the training. It's absolutely key. And with that, a very important aspect of it is uh, skills validation, uh, defined as industry-led certification as and micro-credentials. Today, employers will, uh, will not want to wait four years to uh, produce new talent coming out of the university. They need that talent today so that they can innovate faster. Mm -hmm. And so those short courses or medium uh, uh, the term co courses and programs are super critical. And one last thing, we should not forget about supporting the small and medium businesses. Large enterprises will be able to reskill or upskill their employees faster or slower, but they will be able to make that happen. Small and medium businesses will always lag behind unless the government will not step in and form a, a real partnership with the industry, with the training providers, so that the, the skills that is needed, that are needed for the employers, for the small and medium businesses are there on the local market. And with that, I'm gonna turn to my last slide because uh, I wanted to conclude with uh, what at, a, at Digital Europe have we developed in order to support you when thinking about the strategy, how to build key performance uh, indicators, what are the best practices, and also some uh, operational recommendations when it comes to digital skills projects and what it takes to make those projects successful. Uh, we build those, um, those documents, the strategies, really thinking uh, and, and considering uh, a great um, sort of uh, vision that is out there uh, by the European Commission with, uh, with a digital decade vision, with Pact for Skills, with a digital education action plan. All these initiatives are very much needed and um, the industry hugely supports that. And so uh, as Digital Europe, we've built uh, a vision 2025, where we've uh, covered a number of uh, sort of areas that are important. That includes digital skills, next to, of course, infrastructure, digital healthcare, digital manufacturing, um, and so on key performance indicators that are super key uh, to, to think about how the success is looking like. And in our case, it is the number of people trained, the number of people certified, the number of people that got a new job, uh, but also how the, uh, let's say, how is the presence of women reflected in the ICT job market? The investment plan, as you know, European Union, or you may, you may be aware of it, uh, European Union has put uh, a lot of effort, effort to, put, uh, to uh, introduce the, the recovery funds um, in the context of COVID, but also uh, the longstanding investment with the structural funds, uh, particularly European Social Fund and so on. Uh, we all learn in this journey and there's a lot of uh, learnings, best practices, and case studies that we can uh, get out of it. Um, and we've built um, quite detailed recommendations as to what to spend this money for, how to spend it, how to implement, how to implement it, what are the, the principles within those investments that should be put in place in order to make sure that we uh, invest in the right way, and we um, uh, we take the uh, the appropriate uh, outcome 
uh, and the and the conclusion uh, from from that investment overall. So I've included uh, direct links uh, to those documents. Obviously, it's a lot, uh, well, much more the, to, to cover and to go through uh, than we have time today. So I encourage you to, uh, to just uh, click on them and, and go through each one of them. If there's any uh, question or anything that I could elaborate on, we can uh, continue during the discussion or also offline. With that, uh, thank you very much for uh, the attention uh, and for having me here today. Uh, there's a contact to, to, to me if, uh, if you need to. Uh, happy to uh, continue the discussion with you all today. Great, thank you very much, Isabella. And thank you very much uh, for bringing uh, the private sector perspective. We are valuing uh, this very much. Uh, and. We're looking forward to, to continue uh, collaboration and strengthen collaboration with Digital Europe as a platform um, associating so many private uh, sector stakeholders active in, in the Europe uh, and implementing a lot at the European uh, level. So thank you very much. And I encourage uh, all participants uh, to put the questions in the chat room. Um, and uh, in the meantime, um, let's, uh, I want to just before we're going to the, our next speaker uh, to, to say that uh, we would aim at um, uh, concluding this session in 20 minutes to have enough space for the next presentations and maybe hopefully uh, at least a short discussion. And so having said that, I have a great pleasure also to welcome on board today our uh, strategic partner, a, a representative of the um, uh, RCC, which is focusing uh, on the Western Balkans, where digital skills have been identified as the top priority for this part of, of Europe. And uh, let me turn to Pranvera and Castrati uh, for her presentation and that we can better understand uh, where the things are moving in this part of uh, Europe. So Pranvera, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Yaroslav, uh, and thank you to uh, all the speakers for very interesting uh, presentations. Uh, as you already put some deadlines, uh, I'd like to keep my presentation short so we also have some time for, for discussions. But I wanted to start with uh, saying that uh, in the Western Balkans, the whole uh, digital agenda, and in particular the digital skills, is seen as a shared responsibility, but at the same time as a shared contribution towards the development of the digital skills. Can I have the next slide, please? And uh, also just to uh, kind of give some additional flavor of uh, where the region is and uh, how the COVID, uh, the, the new realities induced by COVID uh, impacted our region. Um, the industry prepared a study uh, in December 2020, and uh, it showed indeed that there is, uh, there is an increase of the use of digital content by the Western Balkan uh, citizens in, in, in general. And it is very, uh, uh, very noticeable that the greatest increase is in education, in social networks, and the information sharing, while uh, the Western Balkan citizens are it, it, it should be kind of worrisome that they are using uh, the uh, they are using the internet uh, less and less to to communicate with the public administration or to to shop online, which already shows uh, the necessity to focus on this uh, on this aspect. But in I mean, not surprisingly, but uh, the increase for digital education and the use of digital content and, and services of the digital platform in education has dramatically increased and. 44.5% uh, of the citizens of the Western Balkans were satisfied and they will continue to use the digital location. However, uh, they are also very keen to, to go back to some traditional, uh, to some traditional education, which would lead uh, to additional needs in the area of digital skills. Next, please. Thank you. So uh, where we stand in terms of digital skills in the Western Balkans, uh, these are some data that uh, we have used in a diagnostic report uh, prepared in December 2020. And you can see that uh, uh, the, the level of digital skills uh, across the Western Balkans vary a lot. Uh, 
Yes, also we see that there is a lack of data and not all economies uh, provide data for digital skills uh, so that are comparable among them. However, uh, this is something that uh, you can see also in Europe. And although we see an increase in, in the individuals having basic digital skills uh, in the Western Balkans, still we are below the average of EU member states in this. And given that EU member states are the mirror uh, where we see uh, towards the, the benchmark we want to go, this is something that, uh, that we uh, really work, uh, work a lot. And uh, you can also see that this, this shared responsibility I mentioned between uh, government, private sector, um, education, and also uh, providers of the trainings across world, if you, wanna, if you wanna call it, but also in the Western Balkans, uh, we have measured this uh, through the Balkan barometer, uh, in particular for the industry. And uh, again, uh, it's the third uh, year in a row that digital skills is very important for our businesses. And uh, for 80% of the managers, uh, uh, they, they claim that the need for digital skills in, in their businesses uh, is very important. While it is a necessity and one of the two topical areas where uh, most uh, employers would require their workers to advance, so to upskilling uh, their, their, um, their knowledge is basically in digital skills. Next, please. Without, uh, without, uh, without uh, burdening further with uh, many figures, uh, I, wanted to, um, I wanted to flag where and what is the way forward for the Western Balkans and what, what we are doing as a region. You uh, all uh, may, may, may have heard that uh, during the SOFIA summit uh, in November last year, the Western Balkan leaders adopted the Common Regional Market Action Plan uh, through which the uh, Western Balkan uh, economies committed to have a coordinated regional response to the digital skills. And this is why uh, we have already networked and we have already uh, established a regional working group that addresses the digital skills from both demand and supply uh, side. And this is important to flag that this working group does not uh, encompass only the Western Balkans, but also has members from the international organizations having a specialized expertise in the field that can support the region. While uh, we are uh, through this uh, common, regional, uh, common regional market action plan, uh, the leaders have also put emphasis on the balanced approach between the national needs and the regional needs. And this is also important to flag that Western Balkan economies vary among each other, uh, not only in their uh, state of development, but also in their EU integration process. And that, of course, drives their agendas based on, on their national needs. But at the same time, being a small uh, region and also small markets, they tend to cluster and they tend to... Uh, uh, all together see how to make supply chains uh, more uh, remotely movable or interchangeable across, across the economies. And for this, uh, they are all very much dedicated uh, to develop digital skills, strategies, and also tailor-made action plans. And this through uh, dedicated training programs, coaching, mentoring, also liaising with academia, liaising with the private sector, with leaders that would like to uh, move, uh, would like to push forward the agenda in, in digital, uh, digital skills development. Next, please. And what we are doing uh, in RC very shortly, uh, what we are trying and what we do in RCC, uh, as already uh, mentioned, we have already established this, the, the permanent regional dialogue and digital skills and uh, network the Western Balkan leaders, uh, sorry, Western Balkan institutions engage in the digital skills and also expose them to the work of other international organizations uh, um, working in the area of digital skills. And I'm, I'm glad to say that uh, some of you are already members of this working of this working group, contributing with with the expertise in the discussion of the Western Balkans, and uh, we have already defined the agenda for uh, the upcoming four years until 2024. And uh, in in this particular uh, element of the digital uh, skills development, we in RCC uh, have engaged together with the Western Balkans in a scoping exercise where we are. Uh, 
pre-assessing uh, the, the needs or the priority sectors and priority uh, the target groups for which a fully fledged assessment of gaps and needs is required. We are at the final phase of um, fine tuning the report and we'll have soon uh, the report shared with the Western Balkan economies to validate the priority sectors. But we are glad to say that, for instance, the uh, public administration is one of the target groups that is mentioned by all economies. And uh, given that they are the ones who develop the digital skills strategies, digital, digital skills policies, we believe that having a focused uh, and a tailor-made uh, support for them is important. While uh, three priority sectors have been already identified, and I'm, I'm glad that this might also help to uh, some additional uh, clustering or, or support in supply chains that the whole region is is uh, um, is increasingly uh, seeking for support. Uh, we hope that through the peering and networking in a structured manner, the region would be able to respond to the needs and while addressing supply and demand. Uh, I also wanted to share with you that very recently ETF, European Training Foundation, did a self-assessment of the uh, needs in the education uh, sector across the Western Balkan region. And it, surprisingly, although all teachers are saying that the need for digital uh, skills is there, it is not uh, very, uh, let's say, very prominently coming from them, what exactly uh, the skills they are required to have and what it, they would like to be further trained in the, in the, years, in the years to come. Uh, the last, uh, but also very important point is showcasing and sharing experience of, of the region. We already uh, learned a lot today and, and heard a lot today, but I uh, think that having the region also leading the experience sharing, uh, it is important because it shows that they deliver, but it shows also that they can learn from each other. So uh, with this, I'd like to conclude by saying that uh, we have done a lot, but there is a lot to be done. And this shared responsibility in developing digital skills policy and shared contribution among all uh, international organizations and regional organizations working in the field is very much required. Thank you very much for the attention and, and glad to any further discussion. Great, thank you very much. Uh, as always, it's a great pleasure to, to hear uh, about the advancement of the great work which uh, you are doing in the terms of the digital integration and uh, also uh, putting the digital on the top of the agendas of all Western Balkan uh, countries. So congratulations to this progress and we are looking forward to, uh, to the next um, steps uh, in the region. Uh, and ladies and gentlemen, now let me turn to our Next speaker, Michał Joga, uh, representing the Intel, so the voice of the private sector. Uh, let's see uh, how uh, the digital skills are perceived and supported uh, by such a big corporations like Intel. Michał, the floor is yours. Okay, now I'm unmuting myself. Thank you, Rosa, for, for introducing me. Yeah, so be, being the last one in the line is also, of course, gives me a privilege to a little bit, uh, you know, reflect on what others said. And uh, there was a lot of uh, really interesting topics, uh, topics covered. Um, uh, as you already said, you know, uh, uh, taking advantage of it, I would like to take us maybe a little bit into near future. Uh, and maybe not repeat myself about the need of, you know, of, of, uh, of teaching the digital skills. Uh, as some of you might, uh, might, uh, might recall, actually, Intel has been very active in this space for, for, for quite some time. Uh, so 20, um, approximately 20 years ago, we had a program called Intel Teach, where actually we, we worked a lot with teachers and we acknowledged the need for, uh, uh, for equipping them with necessary skills to, to, um, to then pass it on further to kids. Uh, the program was concluded with, uh, with a big success, uh, you know, and over 15 million teachers trained uh, worldwide. Uh, though actually right now, having in mind that, you know, all of these great initiatives that you talked about are actually, uh, are actually in place, uh, I would actually like to focus today on on one thing that is actually taking my mind and my mind of, 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 uh, of uh, many people at Intel uh, a little bit looking into the future. So um, I'm not going to use any slides because I'm making final remarks anyway, 
So, uh, so just you know, would like to 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 go a little bit upwards and talk about this advanced digital skis, which actually um, uh, you touched base um, upon a little bit, especially Isa. Uh, and uh, being honest, I don't think that it's quite good to put all of these advanced skills in the same in the same bucket, right? So if you're talking cloud computer, cybersecurity, automation, and AI, uh, you know, it's hard to compare them. Uh, as much as, of course, we need, do acknowledge increasing need for specialists in these areas, I think that one of these technologies uh, really stands out. And uh, I'm talking about artificial intelligence. Uh, so, uh, you know, not only being able to program uh, respective uh, algorithms, but also to understand the technology uh, in our mind is actually uh, it will be the prerequisite, especially for young people today, and especially that uh, that uh, what uh, having in mind what was said already about it, uh, it will be prerequisite for them to succeed in the in the future economy. Uh, and why I told you that I'm taking you into the near future, as um, it's it's not really science fiction anymore. It's here and it's now. So companies that that will not adopt. Uh, you know, uh, uh, artificial intelligence uh, will eventually be performing more expensive, less accurate services that will take actually more time to deliver. So the question is who would like to pay for this? Uh, and of course, you know, looking at, at, uh, at adoption of AI and adoption of many digital skills, we would say, yeah, you know, why not to turn to Schumpeter's theory, right? Which said, well, you should not be worried because the jobs that will disappear or that will get a certain level of automation, well, then, you know, the new jobs will be created. But I think what was through 60 years ago when Schumpeter created this theory might quite not be uh, applicable today for actually three specific reasons. So first of all, I think with regard to AI, we're talking about the unprecedented scale of changes. We're not talking anymore of simple jobs. We're talking of a high profile jobs. We're talking doctors, we're talking lawyers, um, all sorts of jobs that so far haven't been impacted that much by, by, um, by coming new technology trends. We also talk about uh, unprecedented pace of changes. And that's what actually I, uh, I just told you about uh, this competitive advantage, which is here and which is now. Uh, and last but not least, extreme mobility. And I think that that's probably the main reason why many, most of the governments that we work with uh, since 2018, when Canada was the first one to introduce a, a, an AI development policy, are actually becoming to realize that the jobs that will disappear in one place, especially when, it, when we talk about new technology space, might not reappear in the same place. Even the jobs that were so far tied to a place, so like, for example, you know, drivers or, 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 or community workers. So with that, you know, we, we at Intel believe that really, you know, giving the, the, the young people abilities uh, to, uh, you know, and building on top of all this uh, basic and the most important digital skills that you talked about, giving them this ability to, to, to make the next step. That's what... Uh, uh, one of you already said, right? Do not stop at the basic digital skills. Make this, make this, uh, make this step uh, uh, forward. I think it was Isa uh, who said that. Uh, uh, this is in core of our action. So, uh, referring to this, you know, we uh, uh, we of course decided to take some action. Uh, uh, so our CEO announced last year uh, what we call the Rise 2030 strategy. Well, actually, Intel made a made a big pledge. So we made a big pledge to train 30 million uh, young people uh, across the world, around the world uh, from the digital skills, uh, focusing on AI. So actually we would like to take the, what we call an AI readiness of young people, of, of future workforce, but also of a current workforce and, and equip them with all the needed understanding of the technology, but also being able to create their own, uh, their own solutions. And of course, this will not happen without, without uh, good basic digital skills uh, acquisition and, uh, and uh, there is a huge need for, for that as well. 
So coming back a little bit to the, uh, and concluding to the European space, the program is being now implemented in, in many regions uh, around the world. Uh, in our region, basically, this uh, we're going from the East uh, program is active in Russia, in Poland, in Germany, in the UK, in France, Italy, Spain, um, Spain, uh, and uh, and Portugal. Uh, and actually, what we see is a great openness and great uh, readiness of of governments to work uh, to work towards uh, uh, you know building the skills into the education system. Uh, and of course, uh, taking into all, all, all into account the fact that we are far from uh, bringing this to the mandatory or let's say the, the basic education level, uh, uh, it will be still an extracurricular activity. We see a tremendous interest from the kids, and also also uh, referring to 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 I, to you, Agi. Uh, a tremendous interest on the female side. So there's pretty much 50-50 girls and boys who are interested in this, uh, in this technology. Of course, they might come up a little bit with, with different solutions. So girls tend to more, more, you know, save the world with the AI and boys maybe tend to fly to the moon. I don't want to be biased here, but, uh, but uh, you know, judging from, the, from different ideas that come around, uh, uh, of course, boys and girls have this specific, though the technology seems to be very much of an interest to both boys and girls, women and, and men. So with that, you know, uh, thank you very much for, for the time uh, that's been given. And I hope, uh, you know, I gave you a little bit of, of our perspective. Uh, sorry for focusing on this particular skill, but uh, I hope I made the point why we think it's so much important. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Michal, uh, for this uh, input. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we, we are arriving to the end of uh, the, this session. However, I would not like to close this session uh, before, be, without asking one uh, question to all our distinguished speakers. This meeting is happening on the margin of the regional forum uh, of the United Nations, where we are discussing the um, opportunities uh, for the advancing the achievement of the SDGs. Uh, and of course, the ICT is in the center of the discussions. Uh, if you would have the power of advising at least and making one policy uh, recommendation for this over 1,300 uh, uh, policymakers uh, joining uh, the forces together from Europe and Central Asia on the the digital skills, what would be uh, this policy recommendation? Uh, and also, uh, if you'd be also able to, uh, to say a few words, what, in, from your perspective, uh, is key in order to strengthen uh, the partnership building in the field of the digital uh, skills development in, the, in our region? So I would uh, start from uh, our, our colleagues from the ITU, uh, and then we would go uh, follow the order of, of all, uh, all speakers. So Susan, I'm turning um, over to you. And be, please be concise, uh, taking into account that we yeah. are running out of time. Sure, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Yaroslav. Um, I will be taking a bit more of the, the global perspective, if you don't mind. Um, and I want to echo other speakers in congratulating everyone for really interesting um, presentations and, and points that were made. I, I very much in, enjoyed all, all the other interventions. Um, so I think coming to your question, um, uh, assuming that the digital skills policy as such is already on the a priority on the agenda. So I'm not saying they should put that on the, on, on, as a priority on the agenda. But, um, but I would say, um, and this refers a bit also to our work, uh, because that's why we focused on that. It is really, really important before you plan your policies to do the national assessment uh, and to take stock of um, what are the skills level in your country, um, who has what skills exactly, who is providing what training and skills, what is the need from the industry and by whom and all of that needs to be linked very clearly to the national um, development strategies because we heard a lot about job ready skills, uh, but we need to be very targeted if we want to be effective and have a, and have a good impact. So for me, 
it's really important to do this exercise uh, before you um, move on and, and formulate your, your very detailed um, strategies um, later on. And then on, on the other question, and I saw that also in the chat on how can we pull together and how can we, we uh, combine and see how we can scale up by, by partnering, I would like to, to come back to what I mentioned in my presentation, the, um, the multi-stakeholder network we are developing with UNDP uh, and other organizations in terms of bringing together precisely all the different initiatives and uh, stakeholders who do work in this field on, on, on digital capacity um, development. And if any of you are interested in uh, knowing more about that, I know that we are already collaborating with, with many um, agencies and other stakeholders on this, then, then please let me know and, and we will add you to this, to this network that is being developed. And we can also include all the initiatives that are being provided by, by different stakeholders in the, in the global database that are being developed right now under, under this, this framework of the SG's roadmap on, on digital cooperation. Thank you very much, um, Jaroslav. Great, thank you very much uh, uh, for this. And now let me move uh, to Agi. Thank you very much, Jaroslav. And it was really interesting to hear, to, to, to listen to all the speakers bringing in different perspectives. So you asked for policy recommendations and partnerships. So as we were talking and also from our work, I will propose uh, one thing that's covering both, which is I think we need public-private partnership policies that are promoting digital skills development. And what I mean by this is that we need the private sector's capacity to, to do this because you know, the, the demand also for the skill set is there. So in a way, it's the capacity of, of well, it's the knowledge to know what is needed, what's the demand. And actually there's a lot more capacity there for training and um, overall coaching and you know, different kinds of capacity building, not just simple schooling and training. Um, that could work with, with the uh, public sector that uh, would uh, put in place policies for promoting the mo most vulnerable to close the digital divide. So I think, you know, this kind of public-private par partnerships, uh, partnerships with us um, to, to really address the skill gaps, that would be very beneficial. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Thank you very much uh, for this. Uh, and now let me uh, turn uh, to Nina. Uh, thank you, Yaroslav. Thank you for an excellent session. I would say for UNICEF, the main message is involve adolescents and young people in all areas of planning and policy development. They have the ideas, they have the knowledge, they can be great partners if they're allowed to co-create and co-lead in the process. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. And let me turn to Isabella. Uh, thanks, Yaroslav. Thanks, everybody. I think uh, I will uh, echo what uh, Agi mentioned around uh, public-private partnership and really highlighting uh, the most, um, the point around shared responsibility. So no single actor will be able to solve all the issues around digital skills gap at any, uh, any level. Uh, so you just, uh, I think we just need to be ready, transparent and open to the collaboration with one another. And the second thing that I wanted to, to highlight uh, is a uh, path to employment. So no education, no training uh, will be ever successful if there's no clear pathway to employment at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the, the, the process. Uh, and that will be my uh, major call to action to everybody that is involved in designing the strategies. Great, right, thank you very much. Let's turn to our colleagues from RCC, Pran Vera. Thank you, Yaroslav. Uh, I'll be very short and I will again echo uh, what I said that shared responsibility and shared contribution in developing digital skills is, is crucial. And just to say that this is a, a non-ending process, it will require a permanent attention to uh, what the, the, the skills, the gaps, in the market are. And if we do not match the supply and demand side for digital skills, I think that we won't be that successful. So I'll close it by, by this. Right. Thank sentence. you very much. And uh, the final word goes to our colleague from private sector, Michal. 
yeah thank you very much for for all these points so so two two quick uh suggestions or recommendations from my side so what we would probably like to see is uh really you know taking care of what is needed now but also really you know observing the trends and looking what will be needed in five ten fifteen years from now uh, uh and then the second point is we would love to see, and I think it's a big role so of your organization here, which you play, uh, uh, of course, exemplary, a uh, certain level of collaboration between countries on the policy level, right? I think that that's, uh, we don't, have, in many cases, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. So, so uh, this would be from my side. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. It's, it's really a pleasure to, to hear that all of the panelists are agreeing on certain items and um, uh, that, in fact, we are creating also the space for the future collaboration between uh, even those who are on the panel if they are not uh, collaborating already. So, dear ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the all participants uh, following us on the uh, live stream, but also here in the meeting uh, room, I'd like to thank you very much uh, for uh, this great panel. Uh, and uh, we are looking forward to uh, to the future cooperation uh, in this uh, regard. Uh, and um, now it's my also pleasure to say that we will be uh, closing this session, going to the 10 minutes of break that we can refresh a bit and we would uh, meet uh, together again at 11.50. You don't have to quit the virtual room, you can stay connected. Uh, but uh, we would start the session in 10 minutes. So one more time, thank you very much uh, and I'll see you very, very soon. Thank you. Thank you.
Welcome back, everyone. Uh, I hope that you all had a very good break and uh, you are ready for us to now dive into session two. Um, this session is uh, Country Approaches to Foster Digital Skills Development. My name is Anna Maria Meshkurti and I will uh, be moderating this session. I'm representing the ITU Office for Europe. In this session, we will give the floor to country representatives to present in depth their national approaches to foster digital skills development. I would like to invite the audience to submit their questions in the chat uh, directed at our speakers. And we will definitely take those questions at the end. Uh, we hope that time will allow for this. For this session, I have the pleasure to welcome our distinguished panelists, Ms. Florenza Haji, who is the Director for Development Programs in the Prime Minister's Office of Albania. Ms. Manana Ratiani, who is the Deputy Director, National Center for Teacher Professional Development of Georgia. Ms. Lisbeth Ruoff van Velten, who is the Chair of the Dutch Interest Group on Digital Skills of the KNVI of the Netherlands. Ms. Nevina Prajzovic, who is the Senior Advisor at the Ministry of Trade, Tourism and Telecommunications of the Republic of Serbia and Ms. Gulsana Mamedieva, who is the Director General of the Directorate for European Integration, Ministry of Digital Transformation of Ukraine. Welcome to all of you, and thank you very much for joining us today to share your country experiences and perspectives. I would like to immediately now invite Ms. Florenza Haji, who will be representing Albanians' perspective in this session. Uh, Florenza, you have the floor. Thank you, Anna Maria, and uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm really honored to be here and uh, give the insights from the part of Albania regarding the digital skills. I'm sharing my screen. Uh, so, as we saw also from the from the first uh, session, uh, uh, it is very important that we uh, see when we talk about digital skills, we see three perspectives, and uh, they are of course interrelated. But uh, uh, we, we, when we are talking about digital skills, we have in mind digital skills in youth and in students and uh, uh, in pre-university students. We have uh, in mind also digital skills for the private sector, and we have in mind digital skills for the government services, so e-government uh, skills. So regarding these three perspectives, uh, this is where I'm going to focus in today's uh, presentation. And as I said, they are interrelated and all the policy making uh, uh, should be uh, somehow uh, uh, focused in these three perspectives. Regarding the uh, unit that I represent, it is called the uh, Development Programs Unit uh, and Cooperation. It is, uh, we are in the Prime Minister office. We are responsible mainly for coordinating among different actors, especially uh, for uh, fields and for areas that needs a lot of uh, coordination, uh, where uh, one ministry, let's say, cannot do the coordination alone. So we assist with that. Uh, we also are responsible for uh, developing um, and drafting together with Lai Ministries uh, development programs, which are uh, not strategies, but they are strategic documents that are more operational, where you have also pilot projects inside, etc. Uh, so uh, regarding the digital skills in Albania, if we could uh, place everything in one slide regarding the uh, responsible institutions would say that uh, there is the prime minister office as i said as a, has a coordination role mainly then it is the ministry of education and sports which deal mainly with the part that has to do with uh, developing digital skills in uh, young uh, students and university students a minister of finance and economy with the uh, vet uh, the professional uh, training uh, programs uh, ministry and also the private sector incentives uh, the national agency for information society it is responsible and it uh, is leading the uh, it has a leading role in developing the digital agenda uh, in uh, our uh, country uh, it is also the ministry of uh, uh, of uh, Technology, the Ministry of Infrastructure and Energy that has the part for policy making that when it comes to uh, digital telecommunication uh, skills. 
then there are also other agencies that are have a more executive role. Regarding national uh, strategic documents uh, that has some, uh, somehow are linked with digital skills development, even though we don't have a strategy until now, especially focused in digital skills, and we should have one. But let's say that for the moment, digital skills development is scattered among some uh, strategic documents. One is the digital agenda. As I said, it's, uh, the new one is under uh, drafting process. The other one is uh, the national employment and skills strategy. Uh, and uh, there are also components there uh, that deals with the digital skills development, mainly for the private sector. Uh, the national strategy for scientific research, technology and innovation, the strategy for education, which we have started to uh, draft uh, and we would like to finalize the drafting process within this year. And uh, a big part of that strategy will be focused on digital skills development. Uh, and the uh, national strategy for development and integration. This is uh, the umbrella strategy that we have in our country, that it's like an umbrella for all the strategies, sectoral and cross-sectoral strategies. It is also under drafting process, the new one. And uh, a national program on innovation and startups, which is um, my unit is uh, responsible of drafting that program together with uh, the other uh, uh, institutions. And in this program, we are focusing uh, mainly on startups and uh, building an ecosystem for the startups to flourish, but also on the innovation for the SMEs and what digital skills they need to, uh, to have and how we can match them with the startups so that we can provide the digital skills that the startups have to the SMEs that are, let's say, until now more traditional and they need to foster this, uh, these skills. Uh, regarding the digital agenda, uh, as I said, we are under the process of uh, drafting it uh, and it is going well, the process. Uh, the three main pillars are these three that you see here. I don't want to go in many uh, very detail on those. Uh, so I just want to uh, stop here for uh, the development of e-government uh, services that we are very focused and have been very focused in developing these e-government services during the past years and will do so until we have, let's say, all the services is uh, uh, digitalized. Uh, and we think that especially now during the COVID uh, situation that has helped a lot, not only the citizens, but also the private sector. Uh, and uh, another uh, pillar is uh, the enabling and developing uh, basic and advanced digital skills as you see, it, in order to involve the population in ICT services and increase ICT professionals. So here, this would be breakdown in a series of measures on how we are going to do that. Uh, regarding the demand uh, for digital skills in, uh, in our country, the current demand uh, is linked to the changes that the economy is undergoing, especially now with the COVID crisis, and uh, is this uh, desire of society to move closer to digitalization. Uh, and this was a desire not only now with the COVID crisis, but we have seen that uh, uh, also before the COVID crisis. Let's say that the COVID crisis just brought it more uh, into focus. Also, the majority of society uh, uh, owns basic digital skills uh, and technology competence. Uh, such as using uh, electronic products, software pr uh, products that are easy, let's say software programs, social media, and uh, may, most of the society, they know how to do online transactions, easy online transactions. Uh, a significant part of the population, uh, mainly those around 15 to 25 years old, they own uh, intermediate digital skills, uh, which means uh, that they have knowledge that they have received in educational, uh, in the education system mainly, uh, that and they can use these skills also for employment, let's say, uh, uh, reasons. Uh, now, we have uh, already, as I said, started to think, uh, when, we, when I say we, I mean the policymakers, uh, to think uh, to, to how to develop policies that are pro-innovation, uh, uh, pro-youth, pro-digitalization. Uh, uh, if we divide these uh, initiatives that we have taken so far in soft measures and hard measures, let's say, the soft measures, uh, uh, we have focused mainly in providing the legislative framework, let's say, that would, would help the youth to, uh, to flourish and then to, to develop their skills and to be more competitive in the employment uh, market. 
uh, we have uh, started, uh, we have developed and drafted a law on uh, startups. We have also gone through all the procedure for uh, public consultation of that law. And as we speak, it is, uh, uh, it is in the final stages of being approved. Uh, and this law, we uh, we have given there, uh, we have uh, focused on all the incentives that the youth needs in order to uh, open a new uh, business that is innovative business and uh, how the government can help them. Also, as I said, the draft of the Startups and Innovation Program, it's another uh, one that we are focusing on. And this is also linked with reskilling and upskilling of SMEs and what incentives can the government give to them. Uh, regarding the hard measures, when I say hard measures, I mean uh, infrastructure. So uh, it is, of course, uh, well known, and, as, and it was also mentioned before, that in order to have digital skills and people uh, to develop digital skills, you, you need infrastructure. You cannot do that even if you have the best policies in place. So uh, the, our infrastructure, when it comes to internet uh, and broadband internet, uh, it's let's say that there are a lot of gaps, especially uh, when it comes to rural areas and distant areas uh, where the internet does not go and there is no infrastructure. So uh, we need to put more emphasis to that and we need to find also partners that can help us uh, uh, to build this infrastructure, but not only in Albania, as we know also in the region and other countries of the region have the same problem. So probably uh, if we develop some kind of uh, uh, mechanism, uh, funding mechanism that we can uh, put in place in order to, to increase this infrastructure and improve it, it would be a, a very good step in order to develop digital skills. Uh, some other instruments, let's say, uh, because it doesn't uh, it doesn't matter only when you have good policies, as I said, you need also infrastructure, but you need also to start with something, start with some pilot projects in the meantime that you are developing your policies, because you can test them and you can see how better to improve the policies. So some instruments that we have used uh, are uh, the tech space, which is a kind of uh, uh, startup community uh, uh, institution, let's say, that was uh, supported by the government and it's for the youth, for them to get more uh, training, uh, to be trained on digital skills and to access uh, the market and uh, the startups to, to link with other startups in the in the Europe or abroad or more abroad. The multifunctional center in the pyramid, uh, we, uh, this is a center uh, that uh, will be, we, we hope it might be somehow also regional at some point, but for the moment, uh, it would be like a co-working space, offering co-working space for, uh, for uh, young people. It will also uh, be uh, focused on, on young people that are like uh, high, uh, high school students to develop their digital skills. And we are uh, implementing the TUMO let's say, uh, uh, strategy. It's a TUMO, it's a, it's a program that is in, in some countries of Europe and now also in Albania to develop, uh, to help uh, young people to develop uh, digital skills from a younger age. And also uh, now we are talking and probably we are going on with that uh, pilot program, uh, a project or a program, it will be a pilot for the first years, uh, to train women, young women, uh, from, uh, let's say, uh, 25, 22, 25 years old, up to 35, uh, to develop digital skills, but not only digital skills in general, but also digital skills that will help them to find work online. So how they can uh, search for online platforms that offer jobs so they can complement their already, because they might have an already uh, job, they can complement it with another online job. Or uh, those women that uh, were uh, laid off now during the COVID crisis and they are at home, so they can access online jobs. So we are going to try that. Also, we are partnering with World Bank with that. And we'll see if it goes well. We'll probably, uh, the, the government will do it as a permanent program and, uh, and put it in its own uh, incentives. Um, 
Now, regarding some objectives that we have for uh, as a short-term objectives, when we when we say when we talk about digital skills and how to develop them, uh, we we want to first identify and promote uh, good e-learning practices, and uh, this is especially now uh, because of the COVID crisis, and it was uh, a need in our country to find those uh, e-learning practices that work and uh, that are effective and, uh, and the, the appropriate online platforms that work well also for teachers, but also for students. So uh, we are moving on with that. We are trying, we have tried and piloted some platforms and we're in a good direction. Then uh, uh, another objective is to increase the capacity of online teaching. Uh, so uh, teachers uh, that, uh, that use these online platforms, but what is the best method of teaching online? Because it's not the same as you teach uh, in the classroom. So this has been, needs to be understood by teachers. They need to be trained and they need to adapt their curricula also. It's, they are not the same curricula when you teach online. And also, uh, very important, is to equip with digital tablets or pads all the pre-university students so that they have access. Because many of them, uh, from what we have done as a, uh, assessments that we have done, they, they either uh, assess, uh, they enter in the classroom, online classroom, through the mobile phones, but they cannot uh, be very well, it's, it's not effective when you just enter from mobile phones or they don't have a computer that is uh, uh, the very, uh, very good computer. So equipping them with the right digital tablets to use for this kind of, uh, in this kind of classroom is a must. Uh, then preparing also and designing uh, user-friendly guides. So once you have done this, you have to put this in, uh, into guidelines that uh, also students and teachers that will come in the future, they know how to be trained uh, through the guidelines and uh, as I said, equipping them also with internet sticks, because in remote areas, there are no, uh, as I said, the, bro the broadband internet connection is not good. There is no infrastructure. So giving them these sticks, they can provide, let's say, as a, it can be a solution for a short term. And the regional cooperation, as uh, Pranvera uh, also mentioned from RCC, we are working a lot uh, on, the, on the regional uh, perspective, also with the other countries of the Western Balkans, because we believe that uh, joining forces together uh, might have a greater impact uh, uh, for the whole region. So uh, we have uh, also put a lot of measures in the uh, Common Regional Market uh, Action Plan, uh, and for digital skills, and we hope uh, we will be able to achieve them. In the medium term, uh, we have uh, we want, as I said, to invest more in digital infrastructure, and we would like to see more support also from other partners and also from the EU uh, on this uh, objective. Uh, we have we also need to uh, invest more in digital skills for jobs. Uh, so in the private sector, uh, uh, through increasing the digital skills of SMEs. Uh, and focus more on e-commerce. E-commerce, uh, it's, a, it's a, an area where Albania is, let's say, it's not, has not a lot of strengths, but we are uh, working on that. We have, uh, uh, have developed a working group in the past year uh, with all the main uh, stakeholders and uh, with the help also of World Bank. And we would like to uh, take, and we have uh, identified a set of measures that we want to achieve uh, in order to make e-commerce a, a better platform for Albania and use more in uh, e-trading. Uh, so, uh, to finalize uh, uh, some recommendations and proposed actions that uh, we see for the future for Albania uh, are, first, uh, uh, we need to see the establishment uh, of some legislation and legislative acts, regulations and standards for uh, the digitalization in general, but also to foster e-commerce, uh, which need to be put in the legislation. Uh, we need to increase the digital skills in SMEs through matching, as I said, startups, existing startups with existing SMEs because they can help each other. Because startups on one side, they don't uh, need a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, financing or they don't require a lot of financing to give them uh, some digital skills to the SMEs so they can match. Uh, the, to continue with the digitalization of the entire public services, uh, which we are at a very good uh, road and we should uh, keep that work up. Uh, organize public information campaigns on using digital services uh, in response to the COVID-19 crisis, but not only, also for the economic activities of different businesses. 
uh, we need to work closely with the private sector on, on encouraging the ICT development. And uh, we need to see what are those incentives that really help them to develop the uh, ICT uh, uh, in, within themselves, within the private sector. Uh, digitalization of pre-university education, as I said, providing those tablets also, and online education. Application of blockchain technology for the modernization of the higher education system is also a must and automatic recognition of academic qualifications. Uh, we have also put those in the measures uh, uh, that we have in the Common Regional Market Action Plan. So we'll work together with the other countries to make this a reality. And uh, we will we'll start uh, now uh, skills need uh, and qualification analysis. Uh, this will be done in the context of the smart specialization strategy, the S3 strategy that we are currently developing to help. And this will help understand the shortages in skills in general, but here uh, digital skills are comprised. So this aims to address them later with this strategy that we are developing. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, this is it from my part, but it will be, I'll be glad to receive any questions or comments. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you, Florenza. This was really great. Thank you for sharing uh, all these important activities that you are planning and the different actions. I'm sure many of us uh, learned a lot from this presentation. Uh, now I have the pleasure to invite Ms. Manana Ratiani, who will present Georgia's perspective. And I would like to also ask the technical moderator to pull up the presentation. Thank you. Uh, Manana, you have the floor. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, it's for me a great honor to be here on this session and to present my center. My center is Teachers Professional Development Center, which is under the umbrella of the Ministry of Education and Science of Georgia. And uh, what we are doing in case of ICT skills development, it becomes really very urgent topic. Next slide, please. Uh, and firstly, when we, we, we were speaking about the situation uh, in a recent year, what happened within the world and within my country too, uh, they, we were not uh, so much prepared for this pandemic, uh, for these transitions that happened in educational system. Uh, and uh, it became very urgent to have those ICT skills for all the educators in all the level of education, preschool education, uh, general school education, vocational and university educations, and for all of them, for students, for pupils, for lecturers, for administrators, all the skills uh, uh, become very necessary ones. Uh, so what happened in the world, uh, we had uh, more than 1,000 disease, infectious diseases that were in the world in a recent 33, 35 years. And uh, those were Zika, MERS, Cole, and SARS, and HIVs. Uh, but, uh, you know, the situation was that uh, proactive public health measures happened uh, during those uh, different kinds of diseases. Uh, but uh, political priorities change as the crisis has come under control. That means that we have not learned a lot from these diseases, from these epidemics and pandemics. And uh, that means that we have to think twice when we're speaking about the COVID uh, pandemics because uh, we don't need to abandon all these platforms and digital possibilities that appear during this year and we gained different kind of experience during that pandemic, but also we have to adopt some kind of uh, innovations and some kind of progress that happened during that. So it uh, was also a possibility for the education system to develop, uh, you know, in a very, uh, um, uh, 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 in a way to progress in the system. So when we're speaking about uh, the pandemic, it uh, shows us that uh, access to the quality for uh, education is very important uh, in the whole world, but uh, this digital divide was set. Uh, previously, we were speaking about the socioeconomic uh, disparities in the world among the countries within the countries. And nowadays, this digital divide shows us that equity issues are very important in the world. And we have to think, you know, about the ICT skills, ICT based learning, which is not possible if we are not having enough infrastructure in place. And even if the uh, remote area 
areas or rural areas and students there and teachers there don't have access to the internet or different kind of devices that allows them and enables them to participate fully in the remote or distance learning process. Uh, so I think that uh, these gaps are important to understand really fully and then to have some kind of initiatives, government-led initiatives or the locally-led initiatives, which will uh, focus on those uh, digital divides that uh, is a new term in our country. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so... Uh, we see here two graphs. The first one is the column graph that is showing how there are the disparities in the world. The last column is about the world and it shows that uh, a share of the students who, who have access to the internet is 53% and others don't have access to the internet. That means that they can't participate in learning process uh, because of the lack of the access to the internet. And we, when we are looking uh, on the regional uh, aspect of this uh, access to the internet, we can see the Western European countries and uh, North America are having access and only 14% of the students are lacking access to the internet. While in, for example, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, 80% uh, of students lack access to the internet. And uh, another slide is uh, this uh, pie chart are showing us uh, uh, the situation. What were the government-led uh, solutions for the uh, remote and distance learning? Uh, distance learning were solution for the 95 governments uh, because they introduced that uh, kind of uh, teaching and uh, 1 billion students were covered within the distance learning uh, process. And also there were some initiatives about TV and radio solutions uh, and learning. Uh, 29 governments has both of them and we don't have information about the 38 governments, what ways they're doing. So maybe some uh, non-governmental initiatives happen within those countries, but there is no information. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, at the beginning of the lockdown, when it happened uh, in Georgia, it was in March. So we have the holidays at school at that period, and we postponed our uh, holidays to have, uh, uh, you know, some time, some period for transforming to the distance solutions in the education system. And uh, we have some survey at the beginning of the pandemics and uh, our teachers to understand what are the needs in ICT based uh, competencies, what they require, uh, what they feel, uh, what they don't know and what they need to know and uh, some type of uh, trainings what they require from us. And uh, it was very interesting that it came out in other also international surveys. We found that information uh, that uh, teachers are saying that uh, not only they need to upgrade their competencies, ICT competencies, but also they understand that students lack uh, ICT skills and it's not enough to fully participate in remote or distance learning. And uh, that was one of the aspects. Uh, even our students are digital natives, you know, they know how to entertain themselves online, how to shop online, and uh, how to chat with each other and uh, be very active in different uh, social nets, you know. Uh, they lack some kind of uh, guidance on the educational platforms, how to participate fully, how to create that uh, interesting, you know, uh, homeworks and etc. Uh, another part was the parents and caregivers who are at home and those parents who have those ICT skills who would facilitate and support their kids uh, to be, uh, you know, very effective in uh, learning uh, within the distance learning. And this came out here also in Georgia. And also there were some other skills named for teachers. And firstly, it was the technical skills, how to share, how to start the call and uh, how to save the documents and be online and share the different kind of uh, activities and assignments uh, within these uh, platforms. Another was the methodology for online learning. And the third one was uh, 
the lack of uh, knowledge of the languages was uh, one of the barriers for our teachers, you know. Uh, and we started to create different kinds of support for the teachers based on this and other, uh, uh, you know, findings. The next slide, please. And uh, Ministry of Education and Science uh, introduced, you know, we have also uh, the cooperation with the Microsoft and uh, this Microsoft set up all the uh, classrooms, virtual classrooms for the teachers and all the teachers, say uh, 55,000 teachers and all the students, say 600,000 teachers were set up, they received those profiles and uh, all the virtual classrooms were set for the uh, students uh, at the school and uh, for the universities, they have a freedom to choose which platform to use for digital learning. Uh, so what came out that we created a lot of guidances, uh, we created a lot of webinars for the teachers, for the students, for the parents, because it was really very important for them uh, to update their, you know, knowledge and skills, and we don't have time for, you know, uh, cascading the trainings or doing such kind of activities, so being online, sharing online, be, having, you know, uh, interactive webinars, it was very important for that period. Uh, what was also important, we introduced also TV school for those who were in the remote areas and don't have access to the internet. And uh, broadcasting, uh, public broadcasting has, uh, you know, a specific uh, times uh, table for those. All subjects and all grades have possibilities to have those lessons uh, on TV. Uh, also, it was very important to share uh, open resources in uh, Georgian language because uh, those teachers who know language, for them, it was easier to find the resources, to adapt those resources and translate for the, their kids. And for others, a special platform was created where we uh, posted some uh, materials based on the national curriculum. Uh, also, uh, Chatbot uh, was integrated in the uh, Microsoft platform, uh, Teams platform for our uh, teachers and for our students and parents. Uh, they could communicate with the bots and they could uh, receive the frequently asked questions. Uh, and you don't need any extra, you know, human resources to sit there and to answer on those questions. And also e-journal was created there and introduced to our teachers and students. And that means that the communicative part was very effective uh, through that uh, uh, electronic journal. And also as the teacher's uh, needs was uh, to understand better the Microsoft Teams, so we created also that training and 16,000 teachers were trained in uh, Microsoft Teams. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, also the webinars were shown by the, uh, you know, more than a million times because they were subject specific the, and teachers were sharing their best uh, experience. And uh, during that time, you know, we find out that a lot of teachers are willing to share their experience to others and that a lot of groups were created created online and the teachers were supporting each other, you know, and that was really very good to uh, observe this type of cooperation uh, among those teachers. Also, we have an electronic uh, magazine for our teachers and uh, more than 400 uh, articles were created, uh, how to support them, where there were deep subject-based pedagogic uh, based for the teachers and million of uh, views and the downloads have those articles and then we published also lessons for distance learning uh, it's available on our uh, platform uh, and also uh, I said that there was a need for the parents uh, uh, to understand how to support their kids and also specific uh, a guide line for the parents guide to the digital world was uh, published and uploaded on our webpage and I think it was really very important 
for them to understand how to secure their kids if the kids are small and they can't secure themselves in online, you know, uh, digital world. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, I think that it's very important uh, that uh, when we find out what are the skills our teachers need to, uh, to develop, uh, that only pedagogy is very important for them because understanding, they know how to design and how to plan for face-to-face, -face, uh, you know, classroom teaching, but they don't know what are the specifications for the online teaching. And because of that, we uh, are now creating and working and we will launch this training for them. Uh, what does it mean to create and to design online teaching, uh, you know, materials? materials and how to provide and how to proceed in the digital world, very interactive student-based teaching and how to be, uh, you know, how to assess and evaluate them in online mode and what are the specifications for them what are the ethics for that? Because we know that we all have that uh, digital footstep, you know, and our uh, students are creating that and they have to understand uh, uh, how to do that. Uh, also, uh, I mentioned earlier that our teachers mentioned in the survey that uh, they need to uh, overcome uh, language barriers because they don't know and they don't understand international languages, some of them. And uh, because of that, now we're working on the specific training, uh, how to overcome these barriers, how to use that uh, online uh, translations, uh, and how to translate those uh, web pages, and also uh, how to uh, subtitle, for example, videos for, uh, which are online, and how to adapt those, and how to share with each other with those translations, you know, to overcome those barriers, how to understand which sources are reliable, and they could trust those sources, and how they could explain that to their students. So there are a lot of things that our teachers need to upgrade. Next slide, please. And also we think that uh, it's very important not only for teachers to upgrade their skills and competencies in ICT, but also for the principals of the schools and uh, for the managers, it's very important because uh, they need to know how to create virtual platforms, not only for training and professional development of the teachers, but also for the cooperation among the teachers and how to launch, for example, uh, the workshops for the uh, different kind of subject groups and the teachers. It's very important to communicate in the digital, uh, uh, do, uh, through the digital platforms because it becomes very convenient for our teachers during this pandemic year. And so we don't want to abandon this type of the, uh, progress that happened within our schools and our educational institutions. And so we want to uh, support also principals and administrations of the schools uh, uh, to keep, uh, to remain that kind of virtual connections after the COVID. Uh, and also it's very important to raise awareness of the parents about the uh, digital, uh, to secure their students and their kids, you know, environment, how, how to uh, protect that, how to communicate with electronic journal, and how to be an online communicator with the school community, you know. So we think about all the sides, about the parents, about the manager, uh, management of the institutions and schools, and about the teachers, how to progress uh, them in ICT skills. Next slide, please. Uh, it's also uh, very important and we decided in our center to create an educational e-house. That means that uh, for our teachers, it become very convenient uh, to participate in online trainings. Uh, this online training saves the, uh, you know, extra uh, uh, fine, uh, from extra finances uh, for accommodation or for uh, travel uh, to the location of the training and also us uh, from uh, the uh, 
Uh, you know, it's not paper based. You don't need to print materials. You don't need to travel to somewhere. So it's environmentally a better way to provide these trainings. And also it's very important because it's saving the time and it's very convenient for our teachers to access those online training. So during this year, we have uh, all the trainings online. Uh, to uh, And uh, now we decided to create that educational e-house. Uh, and if you will go to the next slide, please. Uh, we decided to have, I don't know, is, is it visible or not uh, for you, uh, but we have here three parts. And what does that mean? First is for the principals and managerial uh, part of the school. For them, uh, it's a man uh, management skills, how to develop them, and also how to do, uh, support uh, uh, principals uh, in, in the educational leadership, because it's very important when you are a head and leader of the educational institution to understand teaching and learning process, which is the main that is happening within your institutions. Uh, and also we have the part for the teachers and we have the part for the parents, uh, how to upgrade their skills. We have different, we will have different kinds of services for the teachers, uh, principals and parents. And that will be uh, training, online training. Uh, and uh, we will have uh, some webinars also forums for the discussions uh, uh, about the, some topics that will be guided by the expert of the field. And also we will have some kind of platform for sharing the best practices because it's important to appreciate those teachers who are doing well and who want to share their practice with the others. And also we will have uh, the special place for uh, different kind of integrated projects because those are becoming a future of the education system because we need a, a project-based and problem-based education in the educational system. Uh, and also when we're speaking about the development of the uh, different uh, professional development for the teachers, as uh, there will be a subject-specific trainings and also there will be a pedagogical trainings and also also we will have transversal or cross-packing uh, issues uh, that we will develop there for example it will be a sustainable development goals or education for sustainable development how to create those skills how to support teachers uh, for example to fulfill and to embed those skills in their education field and also there will be about the citizenship, digital citizenship, uh, global citizenship, which is becoming very meaningful in the modern globalized society. Uh, we will have a different kind of uh, literacy, entrepreneurship, uh, uh, skills, uh, and uh, also we will have ICT competencies development uh, on this platform and trainings will be about that and also about the action research because our teachers should be a researchers as they don't have to wait for others to help and support them uh, in the center or at the ministry, uh, but as they have to make some researches and have a decision that will be evidence-based decisions. Uh, so we think that it's very important nowadays to step forward and to develop such kind of uh, educational e-house for our educators, uh, that will be a very helpful for them and they could find uh, professional development trainings uh, uh, based on their real needs, what they have. Uh, so uh, that's uh, the final point from our center and uh, from me and thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you very much. This was very, very interesting. And I really like the school for parents. So I'm sure the kids will be very happy about this. Thanks also for uh, sharing with us the survey results. That was very interesting. The various activities like the chatbot, the journal, which will obviously stay behind uh, as we go back, uh, I guess. And, and this is very, very great activities to be implemented also for the future indeed, and to be taken as an example. So I will change a little bit the order now because uh, Miss Gulenko, uh, Sana Mamedieva, she will uh, join us very shortly as she has another commitment. So I would like to give the floor to Gulsana now to 
to uh, go ahead with her intervention. Uh, Gulsana, you have the floor and you can share the screen as well as you wanted to share your website, I believe. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm um, just a moment. Uh, I will yeah, share screen and um, moment, yeah, this is my B. Perfect, we can see. Yeah, uh, I will start probably with, um, the, will come up to, uh, to the screen uh, a little bit. Um, we have a Minister of Digital Transformation and we have uh, four main goals, uh, which is 100% of online services, public services are available online. Uh, Six million people uh, of Ukrainians at least basic digital skill. Um, IT sector consists 10% of Ukrainian, uh, uh, 10%, uh, yes, the Ukrainian GDP consists uh, of 10% uh, IT sector, come from IT sector, and 95% of Ukrainian controlled territory uh, covered with broadband uh, coverage. So this all aims are strategic, they all are connected and uh, depends on each other. As uh, I would not repeat, yeah, like I see the, how professional approaches are in other countries and uh, so we do and we understand how the digital skills and the infrastructure are connected so it, it is uh, should be solved together um, for the de developing digital skills we have two components online and offline uh, offline is a bit uh, slower now due to the pandemic uh, but online it, it is a boosting uh, actually online uh, platform that we developed and launched and uh, now you see it uh, I will show you here. Um, yeah, uh, this is a national platform uh, on digital skills where uh, consists of the series or courses. Uh, they are built in the format of edutainment and have a TV stars uh, short series which consists of have a stop lessons. Um, they're really popular in Ukraine because we do it on really actual uh, topics, for example, how to make uh, uh, your oven blog. Uh, we have uh, social uh, internship uh, courses. We have uh, let's, uh, how to create business in creative industry, uh, how to the financial uh, competences for uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, the basics of the cyber, uh, like cyber security uh, and uh, yeah, the artificial intelligence uh, for the students and uh, for the pupils in school uh, and so on. We have 30 more uh, courses and um, each of them are li really have a high rank of their, um, of their uh, auditory and um, um, this is also, we have a Cifra uh, Digigram, uh, this is a national uh, certificate which you can get uh, to uh, prove your level of digital skills. And um, this is like 10, 90, it takes 30, 40 minutes to take and it is acceptable in different uh, uh, platforms across the country. For example, you can find uh, like work uh, and uh, yeah uh, so on and uh, uh, they're very popular uh, artist in Ukraine uh, the singer uh, Alena Alona she is promoting she uh, this uh, actually we find a really I think great solution to involve popular people uh, to promote actually digital skills digital literacy to make it really fashionable and modern in Ukraine uh, now we have also starting um, our digital uh, European actually digital skills week, uh, which is uh, built on the uh, we involving uh, I will stop share uh, we involving uh, pub, uh, private companies uh, to help us to promote. It's a really huge network of the uh, starting from the magazines who sell the phones or. Uh, actually, the like many many companies do, joined this digital literacy week, uh, which is held from 22 to 28 of March, uh, and um, we see, we see how effective it, it is. Uh, so we have courses, we have special platforms, uh, and the offline component uh, is a build of digital skills, which is built on the 
uh, network of libraries uh, which have computers and uh, we made a course for trainers so we teach trainers who teach these courses in the libraries uh, this is a plan component and it's starting working in some regions in Ukraine where we have a good uh, uh, actually not uh, uh, not high level of pandemic um, we have also uh, the concept, uh, the national concept and strategy uh, approved by the government of Ukraine, uh, which is actually focused on digital competences and to uh, and aim to include digital competences in the uh, different sphere of, uh, for example, for teachers, for medical service, uh, and so on. Um, this is. Uh, I also would like to share one more. Um, result of all work. This is online school, uh, all Ukrainian school online. And uh, we have here the courses, uh, actually lessons, yes, for each grade. It's built for uh, pupils, yes, who are in not, uh, and for schools uh, as an instrument for developing uh, distance learning. And you can find, for example, different subjects for the fifth grade. And so on we have, it's only like, it's developing now, but it has already have a lot of, um, a lot of subjects for actually each grade uh, in school starting from fifth. Um, wait a moment, I will stop sharing. Um, we also have in digital skills, we have a big uh, component and uh, focus on child online protection. Uh, because now it is important with the coming pandemic and they're spending more time online. And uh, we build actually um, a national strategy. Uh, child online protection is going to be approved really soon by government of Ukraine. We have built really a lot of instruments like chatbots on cyberbullying, where to help, for example, they will uh, chatbot help um, children to find advice, to have support get information, how to delete information, uh, to delete cyberbullying, and etc. Uh, now we are working on the all governmental platform on online safety. It's one of the com big component safety of digital skills. Uh, and it's going to be presented by the end of the summer this year. Uh, also with two components. First components is education and um, prevention and second component it's response and uh, instruments for filing the claim so basically shortly uh, it is it uh, what we are doing in ukraine and uh, uh, i want to say to add the digital skills a really high priority but, but we understand that it's follow actually after the infrastructure building so we have um, a lot of things to and work with many partners, including ITU uh, in this uh, sphere uh, to build uh, actually broadband coverage uh, and with um, in, in international financial institutions uh, to help us with this, because uh, I think with the pandemic and many would agree that internet coverage and actually uh, going with the internet to the rural area, it's one of the uh, biggest priority in, in it must be in each country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gusana, for sharing this with us. And I am aware that you have to go somewhere else. So we will definitely uh, let you continue. And it was very interesting to see how you're making digital skills fashionable in Ukraine. A very, very nice perspective on that. So thanks again for joining us. Uh, I would like to now invite uh, Miss Lisbeth Ruof van Velsen to give her perspective uh, from the Netherlands. And the moderator has kindly shared the presentation. Lisbeth, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you for inviting. And I, I see you can go to the first one, perhaps, because then you no first uh, the, 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 the other way around one. Yeah, because um, I wanted to show where the Netherlands uh, is based um, and that I'm very pleased that I may represent the KMVI. The KMVI is uh, the Royal Dutch Society for the Information Professionals. Um, and uh, the title Royal we have because we are existing already a hundred years. And if I'm listening to, 
to the stories of the others and uh, and 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 of course the ICT industry, then you would think, how can they manage to get 100 years old? That's due to a part of our KNVI, the professionals, and that's the archives and the information gathering, the libraries. Uh, they have already a long history, but they have become digital too. And they are part now of our organization, of our professional organization. So uh, very pleased to listen to you all and very pleased to see so many women uh, in, in my longstanding uh, 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 a career, you can say, in the IT industry, I, I think I've never had the opportunity to be in a list of speakers with so many women. Um, so it's great. Um, if that can continue, it, uh, it, it's uh, very hopeful for the future. Uh, next slide now, please. Um, um, the agenda. Um, I just want to say, to set the, the scene a little bit. Um, uh, because I'm not from the Eastern, I'm from the Western the EU. I talk a little bit about the digital skills, a topic of today. Challenges I take with a, with a smiley, some advice and questions. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the Netherlands. Um, I think it's important to uh, take uh, uh, this kind of information also into account when you're talking about digital skills and the digital uh, environment. Uh, we have 17.5 million uh, inhabitants uh, and a density of the country of 400, uh, 500, you see it, and currencies in Europe, 500 kilometers per square meter or per square kilometer, sorry. Uh, currency is a euro, our language is Dutch, so not the English language, and we have a GDP ranking of 17. Why am I saying that? Because money is involved, but also the easiness of a country. Um, and, um, and the easiness is uh, that our country is flat, and perhaps you know the Netherlands from the cows, that's also seen. Um, it has a lot of water, and very uh, houses near to each other. And of course, perhaps you know only the Netherlands from the tulips, they are still there. There is still room for tulips and windmills. And windmills now for the climate change, of course, very important. Next slide, please. Um, and some of the presentation in the first session were already talking about uh, indexes or rankings or all that kind of things within the Netherlands is part of the EU. And in the EU, we use the Digital Economy and Society Index. Um, and in setting the scene, um, it's important to realize that the Netherlands is in the top of the rankings in Europe. With uh, uh, We are fourth with the uh, Nordic countries, Finland, Sweden, and Denmark ahead of us. But you see the EU average is uh, yeah, it's still a long way from us. Uh, so, so we are in the forefront of what's happening, uh, of, of what, what, what you can do, or what, what, what has been done in the digital world. In that index, we are, lose, uh, we are looking at connectivity, use of internet services, integration of digital technology and digital public services, and of course, human capital. Um, and that's a little bit uh, different from the, uh, I think the index is currently used within ITU or what I hear uh, passing around. I think it's, it, it would be good if we can connect those indexes, but that's an advice or an idea. Um, next slide, please. What's also important, um, and I, uh, I didn't realize um, when I was asked for the presentation uh, that um, that also I had to look at, uh, or I had to look, but but that education uh, is still in the center of um, uh, of what's happening. Education is uh, is so important that it's not in in the top of my mind. The top of my mind was the fact that with digital skills, we 
forget to uh, focus it on different groups. And, uh, and that's an, an issue really in the Netherlands uh, because we have consumers, citizens, professionals in general and ICT professionals. And of course, education at universities and, and basic education is also a an, an domain, but in the usage of the, uh, of, of the digital world, you have also to focus on different, to, to, to focus on those different groups. Um, I, in this presentation and the time given, I'm only focusing on the ICT professionals, um, but the others are addressed, for example, in the parents' uh, education school, I think in the Ukraines, but also what I heard from, from the regional approaches. Uh, so you're looking at, uh, at the others, certainly don't forget them. Next slide, please. Um, the work uh, focused in the Netherlands around ICT professionals um, is dated, uh, started in 1982. And um, so that's almost uh, 40 years ago now. And it's the last and final edition of um, the idea of uh, the IC, looking at the professional, the ICT professional world uh, was made in 2017, but it was also the final and, and it's written in Dutch, but it's called uh, working in a digital world. And why we are, uh, is this the final? That's due to the fact that uh, we are not looking anymore to only our country and, and in our Dutch language. We, we, we had to admit that we have to go more international in an EU perspective or a global perspective because you can't take your own perspective and focus only on your own country uh, because the digital world is going so fast um, that um, you uh, that you, you have to work together to follow and to to uh, to to use the the possibility and the opportunities given by the digital world. So this uh, last document uh, took already eight years. So we started to look at what's happening in Europe, and that's. Uh, covered by uh, the TC428. Next slide, please. And that's a very busy slide. Um, <laughs> and you see, that's also one of the reasons why we are now doing it in an EU perspective and not on our own. Um, um, and this initiative um, is, uh, is also supported already for a long time by André Richer. I saw him in the presentation uh, for Digital Europe that, that uh, she used uh, the, the pyramid uh, used by André Richer. Uh, but anyhow, um, it's good to see his name back. Uh, this CENTC is focusing on four, uh, four uh, building blocks. And, um, and the idea is to make standards standards we can use everywhere in Europe, not only to use, but also that you can travel and, and use each other's knowledge and people uh, uh, around the European countries. Uh, it's not made only for Europe. And uh, I really want everybody who is looking at it to use it too, because it's we, it started in Europe, but we hope that we can share it with a lot of other people. Um, there, is, there is already one standard uh, established that is the European e-competence framework. Um, I'm not going in detail. It, it exists of 41 uh, competences and seven transversal aspects. Combined with that um, uh, framework, we have created a um, profile 
a family tree, an European ICT profile family tree, you see that on the uh, right side. And um, it has some basic profiles. And for the rest, it has templates, how you can develop your own template uh, and your own role. Um, that's already in the standard. Currently, the other three are under development and most important for me currently and already almost done is the body of knowledge. Uh, because what we came, and I'm part of this CENTC 428, by the way, uh, that's why we, I'm talking as a we, <laughs> uh, that um, we still have not a common ICT knowledge um, established worldwide. So, um, and we think that it's very important that we create some common um, uh, knowledge and, um, and, uh, and we do our best to, to set some, uh, some, some ideas together and, and build a an, an basic standard. And you see that on top of it are all specialist uh, information, but that there is some common ICT knowledge so that you can share worldwide, globally, um, uh, how to approach and how to think about ICT. If we don't have that worldwide uh, share of talks and language, it's difficult to use it worldwide. Um, I put also there where possible the links to the websites where you can find absolutely more information than I can talk of. Next slide, please. Um, then you think, okay, you have made an, 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 an framework and you have made a standard. Is somebody using that standard? Uh, and yes, uh, it's, it's used. It's in, in Germany uh, and France. It's used by, uh, for example, Airbus. And there you see already Germany and France do have two different languages. But by using the framework, they can share uh, and they have also a different uh, uh, history in, uh, in the IT world, but using this combination of, um, uh, of the ECF, they, uh, 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 they, they, they uh, there is now, um, sorry, somebody is walking in. And, um, um, we have the, the Dutch government who is putting their old um, uh, framework into the ECF to, to, uh, to, to also proceed in a more quick and, 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 and easier thinking, although it looks like not that easy. It is easier. Next slide, please. Um, you saw in the building blocks mentioned perhaps, uh, and I didn't uh, put the finger there on it, the code of ethics, because that, that is still in Europe in a starting phase, in development phase, but internationally, um, uh, and I may also be a member of the, this, this group uh, and play a role in it. Um, we've created a code of ethics. And also that I think is important that we share this worldwide and, and that we share that this already exists uh, because it gives seven common ethical principles, but also uh, a responsibility specific to the ICT profession. And what I like very much seven responsibilities for those with a leadership position looking at uh, and, and responsible for ICT usage, so the digital world. Why is it important? Because we have to, to keep our trust in the digital world. And uh, if we do not use in some way or another a digital, um, uh, an ethical code, it can be abused. 
how and and I think uh, the person from Intel was addressing already in AI. Uh, you see some abuse coming up, um, uh, and um, uh, I see in the chat also that uh, somebody is the Digicomp uh, calling, but indeed Digicomp, of course, is uh, already. Uh, uh, a an, an framework used for uh, citizens and professionals. Um, this is the IFIPS code of ethics, um, also written a link and you, it can be used by everybody and can adapt to every culture or uh, legislation system. Next slide. The challenges. Uh, and uh, we had a head start, or we, we started earlier than uh, some countries. But with a head start, that makes you lazy. Uh, and uh, so if I listen to, for example, the Ukraine or to Albania, and I think, yeah, they can build that all together. That's great. Um, uh, be, because they have not that backlog uh, of, uh, from 82. Uh, take, for example, the profiles, um, they can have a fresh start. Um, that's not something we can do in the Netherlands. We, we have that backlog, we have that, inf that uh, uh, information sitting in our, uh, on our back. Uh, so that's, um, uh, so, so yeah, um, we say, okay, we don't use and, and we are not looking what has been invented somewhere else. We, we continue with working and sometimes it's very difficult because we have those large old systems. Um, if uh, getting a head start, what we have forgotten uh, is the literacy. And I spoke in the beginning already of 70 million people, but we have more than 2 million inhabitants who are not able to read enough, uh, are literate enough to use the digital world. And that's a big part. And that's the part you want to reach and to reach out. And um, it's addressed in different uh, elements. And uh, I think I have to admit that in the Netherlands, we do not have yet the, the right instruments to address that properly. And we have to do it as quickly as possible but because liter literacy and be lazy creates the digital divide. Yes, we have a lot of people who are uh, at a good level, but not everyone is at a good level. Next slide. So my uh, advice with the smiley is uh, learn, copy and use what has proven to work because we have not enough time to make all the mistakes ourselves. And uh, partner as much as possible. So that's why I'm so very pleased that ITU is taking this lead. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to me. Thank you very much, Lisbeth. Thank you for sharing the advice as well and your perspective. Uh, it was very, very interesting. Uh, I know that it is one already and uh, we said that the session will end at one, but we will take 15 more minutes because we already gave some minutes from our session to the previous one uh, and we will close it around 1.15. And now I have the great pleasure to invite Ms. Nevena Prajzovic, who will be representing a Serbia's perspective and sharing it with us. Uh, Nevena, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I will present uh, digital skill development in the Republic of uh, Serbia. So I will change slide or you. Uh, Our moderator will do, so you can just say next slide. Next slide, please. Uh, last year, in February, the government of the Republic of Serbia adopted the strategy for digital skills development in the Republic uh, uh, of Serbia. This strategic document was adopted for the period from 2020 to 2024. Next slide. Uh, we defined four priority areas in uh, this document. Uh, this is uh, area uh, education system, then citizens, uh, labor market and ICT professionals. 
uh, these um, uh, four priority areas uh, we defined in accordance with new skills agenda uh, for Europe. Next slide. We have one overall objective of the strategy and four specific objectives, which are defined in accordance with the priorities. Uh, the overall objective is to improve digital knowledge and skills for all of all citizens, including uh, number members of vulnerable groups. Uh, and of course, uh, in order to enable the monitoring of the development of ICT technologies in all fields and to meet the needs of the economy and the labor market. So first, uh, goal uh, is improving digital skills in the education system. Second one is uh, improving uh, digital skills for all citizens. Third, uh, developing digital skills uh, in relation to the needs of the labor market. And the fourth, lifelong uh, learning of ICT professionals. Next slide. Uh, strategy for digital skills development is uh, drafted in accordance with EU digital competencies framework for citizens, which offers uh, tools to improve citizens' competencies and identifies the key components of digital competence in five areas, information and data literacy, communication and collaboration, digital content creation, safety and problem solving. Next slide. For the implementation of the strategy, uh, our plans uh, um, are that we will have two action plans. Uh, first one is for implementation of the strategy in the period 2021 to 2022. And second one uh, uh, for period 2023 to 2024. Next slide. Uh, action plan, first action plan uh, proposal is drafted. The Ministry of Trade, Tourism and Telecommunications as a policymaker uh, has started a procedure for initi initiating public debate for this uh, document. Public debate uh, will last for 20 days and we, it is expected that action plan uh, will be adopted in June this year. Next slide. Uh, when it comes to a uh, uh, proposal of action plan for implementation of the strategy, I would like to say that uh, the role of partnerships uh, is very important in this procedure uh, because according to the action plan proposal, uh, numerous measures and activities will be implemented in cooperation with our partners. Uh, it is USAID project, Cooperation for Growth. Then we have Propulsion, New Literacy. Then we have Office of UNICEF uh, in, um, uh, in Serbia. And of course, uh, cooperation with the European Organization for Security and Cooperation in uh, Europe. Of course, there is a Ministry of Education and the Government Office for IT and e-government. So, uh, crucial thing is partnership and cooperation with uh, other stakeholders because digital skills uh, topic uh, is a topic that needs multi-stakeholder multi approach. Next slide. Regarding a first uh, goal, uh, improving digital competencies in the education system, we defined two measures, providing conditions for learning and acquiring digital competencies in the education system, and second one, upgrading curricula for the acquiring of digital competencies in pre-university education. Next slide. When we speak about digital skills for all citizens, we all know that citizens need digital skills for everyday life activity. Uh, so how to pay bill online, how to send an email, how buy something and pay for it online, etc. So within this objective, we have several uh, measures, raising awareness uh, activities, uh, improving digital skills for uh, citizens at the local self-government level, etc. Next slide. 
When we speak about labor market, uh, we all know that digitalization process has uh, already covered all areas of society and the economy. So digital skills are required for almost all jobs. So within this goal, we have uh, several measures meeting the needs of the labor market for digital skills at all levels and promoting opportunities in ICT sector improving cooperation between relevant institutions, public sector, private, se private sector, non-governmental organizations, and developing digital skills of employees, including public administration employees, with a focus on digital skills that are related to the sp uh, specific of the workplace. Lifelong learning on, of ICT professionals. It is the fourth ob objective in uh, strategy and action plan. Uh, numerous studies indicate that there will be tens of millions of jobs in the world over the coming years for those uh, with advanced digital skills in the areas of artificial intelligence development, cybersecurity, the Internet of Things, mobile applications, etc. So, within this goal, we defined several measures, increasing research capacity in the ICT field, improving the digital skills of ICT professionals and promoting lifelong learning, monitoring the number of young people, especially women, educated and training in ICT professions and monitoring the needs of the economy and the ICT sector. Next slide. That is all. I hope that next time that when we will have a session like this, we will speak about implementation of the action plans and our results in this uh, field. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. This was really great. And thank you for this very concise and precise presentation. Really appreciate it. Uh, also very good points because actually we will be having the breakout rooms afterwards. So you are leading us directly uh, into the right place. Um, so I don't want to stand between anybody and lunch. And uh, I would suggest that uh, I thank all our speakers for, for joining us. And we hold to our questions for the afternoon as we will be going into breakout rooms with the audience and I saw a couple of questions and messages coming in the chat and I'm sure that uh, many uh, audience members would like to discuss with you more in details about the different activities that you have done, the different plans and, and programs that you plan to implement in the future. Uh, so if you all agree I would uh, like to we end the session now and we will uh, revert back at two o'clock where we will have a quick presentation uh, on the um, toolkit, on, on the uh, guidebook, on the assessment of the digital uh, skills from one of our ITU colleagues. And then we are going to dive directly into the breakout sessions and we will have a little bit more explanation later on how those will work. And that's going to be really the part where together we, we discuss all of this and come out probably with some more recommendations and solutions. So thank you very much again to all of our speakers for joining us and I will see you later and in the breakout sessions and we will revert back at two o'clock and I hope you have a very good lunch uh, and see you at two o'clock. Thank you.